And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It. Today, we're going to be breaking down the Jeffrey Dahmer case. You guys know this is trending all over the place thanks to the Netflix special. Let's get into it. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Fed It covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of premeditated murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants is, uh, six nine. And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, six nine ran. I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes, aka Pusha T, violated. In order to stay away from the victim, rapper Pusha T arrested after shooting at King of Diamonds and Miami Strip Club injured one this person. Is the, this is the one that that's gonna fuck him up because this gun is not traced. Well, what happened at the gun range? Here's your boy 42 Doug right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. They can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm gonna lock my trip away. Right. And well, the first bomb went off right here. Suspect two sent down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al Qaeda. Two terrorists, their brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lynn Sarnev. When the cartel shipped drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay, trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. All right, and we are back. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It, man. I'm glad to be back. <laughs> man, it's been a while. As you guys know, uh, we were in London for quite a bit of time in Romania. Shout out to the Tate Brothers. Shout out to all our um, UK guys out there. Mandam, King Riches, you know, Troy Francis, etc. Did a couple podcasts out there. As you guys know... Fed it requires a lot of research, man. Like I'm over here taking all kinds of notes, being prepared for this joint. And, um, you know, sometimes it takes me weeks on end to research a case and make sure that I can come correct and be able to present as many facts as possible so I can give you guys an educated breakdown. And, you know, at the end of the day, I got to, you know, put my little spin on it as well as a former federal agent. So um, these these types of um this type of content requires a lot of uh, research, essentially. And between, you know, fresh and fit, the fitness stuff, everything else that I'm doing, it takes quite a bit of time. So I apologize for not giving you guys an episode for the past two weeks or so. I've been releasing clips, but let's be honest here. We all know that the live breakdowns is the best and uh, also the documentary as well. Now, as far as the Hitman documentary that I'm going to be doing, guys, I won't uh, be able to drop that one until next week. I don't know why, but for some weird reason, YouTube has given me a headache with getting it cleared through the um the person that owns it or whatever you know as you guys know copyright all this other crap which typically it's re it's a reaction video it's fair use um uh, but it's taking a little bit longer than usual so i should that have have that out for you guys uh this coming week it's a really interesting episode it's based on a individual who committed a triple murder uh using <laughs> A fucking handbook, okay? I know, I know. Very like, what the Stupid. hell? But it was a very interesting case, and um, he committed triple murder with you know for some money, etc. And it was really interesting. And um, yeah, that will be dropped uh this week. It was a reaction video I did. Uh, shout out to Christina; she helped me with that one as well. Um, but anyway, uh, today we're gonna be breaking down the Jeffrey Dahmer case. As you guys, if you guys have been living under a rock, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, I've I knew about him for a while, but he's you know rose to prominence recently because of a viral netflix documentary and uh i've been getting requests for serial killers quite a bit um next i'm probably going to do, do the killer clown for you guys all right nancy right i know a lot of you guys want me to do that one as well so i'll start hitting some of these serial killers the charles mansons etc um but before i get into all that and you know uh what we're gonna do the jeffrey Dahmer breakdown i got a special guest in the house you want to introduce yourself to the people real fast Yes. Hey, guys. I'm Autumn. I'm 25. I'm going to school for computer science. I live in Tampa, but I'm hanging out in Miami for a few days. Thought I'd jump on this Jeffrey Dahmer podcast. It's super interesting. So stay tuned. Bam. All right. Welcome. 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 Yeah, she's going to be giving me a helping hand here. Uh, can you highlight those super chats for me, by the way? The the things on. Uh, yeah. So uh, so I'll hit some of these chats real quick and then we'll get into it, guys. Uh, and I appreciate you guys for all the support. I really do. Fresh is in the chat as well. Shout out to Fresh. Uh, 
And uh, this dude, man, he tried to make fun of me earlier. You got feet as pretty as fresh. Bro, Fresh's feet are disgusting. <laughs> if you've ever seen them, my man never puts lotion on them. Uh, repent and obey Jesus. 20 bucks goes, Fresh needs uh, Fresh needs to do... Here, I got it. I got it. Don't worry for now. All right. Fresh needs to do bare minimum of five push-ups every hour for 16 hours a day. That would help motivate him more, even during the shows. Also, people on depression medication shouldn't be allowed to drive. Revoke the license. Okay. Okay. That's an interesting tidbit there, but all right. Uh, what else do we got here? We got um, Leaks 5 goes, the two cops that fed the Asian teen to Dahmer were reinstated and one was elected as police union president. Milwaukee PD, inept or corrupt? That's a good question. I'll answer that later on in the show because I don't want to give too much away for the people that may have not seen the Dahmer um, Netflix series, which, matter of fact, I'm going to do a poll here in a second with y'all. Uh, we got Christina Brown uh, Lee goes, uh, thank you for being kind to Trillstein and Chrissy. Yeah, anytime, man. You know, we we always show uh, politeness to anyone that shows politeness. Uh, shout out to Trill. Uh, and then we got here. Now we know why you are late. Ha ha ha. Fuck you, bro. <laughs> this nigga talking shit. Uh... And then we got actually that was the reason why I was actually late was and she's my witness. Were we or were we not researching? We definitely were. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. We were researching. All right. Not the type of researching that you perverts are thinking about. Uh, just want to know what you majored in college to work for Homeland Security from Kevin. I majored in criminal justice, guys. I was uh, I was an intern with Homeland Security from 2010 to 2013. I became an agent in 2013 and I went to my first duty station in Laredo, Texas in 2014. Uh, Isaiah's five bucks. Yo, my uncle's friend was killed and my dad's cousin was asked by Dahmer to leave with him. Luckily, he denied. Oh, shit. God damn. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Okay. And shout out to Aaron Clary. Aaron Clary was actually living in uh, Milwaukee at the same time. I'm surprised that Dahmer didn't get him. Uh, <laughs> Mel Vargas, $1. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And then we got uh, Jay. Oh, shout out to Jay Spansky. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to expose this dude uh, too much, but uh, that's my childhood friend right there, guys. That's one of my best friends uh, growing up. So, uh, yo, Jeremy, drop your, your Instagram for the people if they want to follow you. But yeah, that's that's my <laughs> that's my childhood friend right there, man. I've known this guy since I was 11 years old in New Britain, Connecticut. Good friend of mine. Uh, fucking ass clown. I hate him, though. But shout out to him. <laughs> uh, I already know why you watching this joint. Oh, man. Anyway, a lot of the crazy humor that you guys see me with, it comes from that fucking guy. Pods Nation, 10 bucks. Myron, as a former human smuggling expert, have you warned Fresh to take the kidnapping class yet? He's running around MIA with half a milli vehicle. <laughs> the LA is even closed as RR Keys SMH. Well, sir, you're conflating, um, you know, kidnapping with human smuggling. Two completely different crimes. Human smuggling is, you know, moving illegal aliens into the United States to circumvent immigration law, right? Border patrol, etc. Uh, what you're talking about is kidnapping, which that is another crime in itself. And it typically doesn't go federal unless you uh, affect interstate uh, commerce, right? You're crossing interstate lines. That's typically when the FBI is going to get involved. Um, I've done kidnapping cases myself as well. Um, I remember one case we had, there was this little girl. She got, uh, we thought that she had got kidnapped or enticed, but she had went to like Mexico to meet with this uh, individual who was a little too old, if you know what I'm saying. And she was like a, like a 12 or 13. Uh, we ended up getting her back and it was great. It was probably one of the best feelings I ever uh, felt was getting that little girl back to her house, uh, to her parents, getting her back home. Uh, Johnny Black, not to be off track, but you should train Aaron more. He constantly skips super chats against your wish. I don't know if he stutters over them or be drunk, but he definitely slap you with his work. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and then you guys got to remember too, that sometimes we have like thresholds, right. To keep the show going. So he might not show your, uh, super chat. If, um, if you might like, let's say we say uh, 20 enough from this point forward and then bam, he's got to go 20 and up, you know, we'll read the ones that came through before, but that's typically the rules. Cause you know, if we spend all day reading super chats, you guys are going to hate us and, and everything else like that. So, uh, yeah. So guys, there's already 781 of you guys in here. So please do me a quick favor, like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you like criminal case breakdowns, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. No one else on YouTube is doing this. And not only is no one else on YouTube doing it like this, but there's no other former federal agents on here breaking out criminal cases for you guys from my perspective. Now, real quick, before we get into this, I want to explain to you guys um, that what, what murder typically falls under, okay? Murder, guys, is almost always exclusively investigated by the state. And the reason for that is because premeditated murder, homicide, etc. unless there's some kind of federal nexus, the feds are not going to get involved. 
what do I mean by a federal nexus? I mean, as in it needs to be attributed to like maybe a gang case, a racketeering case. Maybe you kill someone during the commission of a bank robbery or a big one for me when I was an agent was uh, like a smuggler, like left an illegal alien for dead out in the brush or they tried to get away from the police and the car rolled over and they died like the, the feds only get involved in murder or some type of homicide when there's a federal crime already being uh, committed to some degree. That's typically when the feds get in. They need some other prerequisite, right, to get involved in murder cases typically. Now, when it comes to like a traditional premeditated murder investigation or serial killer, et cetera, that almost always falls under the state. Now, have I ever done uh, a murder case where I was the lead investigator for a premeditated murder. No, most federal agents don't investigate murder like that. There's some in rare situations where they do. Like, let's say um, you work for like the park forest, the, the park service, right? And you're in a special agent with them. And then someone commits a crime, right? In uh, protected land, that's federal uh, federal land. Then yeah, they'll get involved in that, right? They'll do, they'll do a, a legit like homicide investigation in that situation alongside the state and locals. But in general, most of the time, right, or an Indian reservation, right, the FBI will go ahead and handle a murder investigation in that situation because it's federal land. In that situation, they will. But in most situations, the state and locals, the county, they're the ones, or the state police, they're the ones that take over and handle premeditated murders, serial killings, et cetera, and then the feds typically come in and assist. So in this investigation, I know what the feds that were involved, the FBI was involved, but they uh, they were more from like an assisting standpoint. They gave a uh, behavioral analysis agent to get in there and interview Dahmer and figure out what the hell his problem was. Um, they gave, they helped out with uh, forensics and DNA, et cetera, but the lead agency was the Milwaukee Police Department, okay? That's the main agency that investigated. So I just want to make that distinction very clear between state and local authorities and then federal authorities and who investigates uh, homicide one or premeditated murder or murder one, whatever you guys want to use for it. Okay. <laughs> Somebody said Osama in the chat. Okay. Hilarious. Uh, hello, my grandson, Myron's grandfather. Thank you. You fucking asshole. You get <laughs> oh man. Uh, and I will be doing, speaking of Osama, I will be doing 9-11 as well. And I'm also working really hard on getting you guys a special guest that may or may not know Osama bin Laden very personal, personally. I locked it in, but I just got to find a date to bring this individual in. If you guys know who I'm talking about, give me a one in the chat. But uh, I'm uh, speaking of Osama. Uh, and it's going to be probably one of the best podcasts. Uh, okay, we read this one. And then let's see here. Johnny Black, I think this we read this one. Cool. I think we're good here. And then this is the last one here, and then I'm going to get into the show, guys. Any chance we can get you to review DG, DEA agent Kiki Camarena and the last NARC doc? It was rumored that CIA agent was present at his torturing. Okay, yes, I can definitely do this for y'all. Uh, for you guys that are wondering, Kiki Camarena was a DEA agent that went undercover uh, with the Mexican cartel. They ended up finding out that he was involved, and in, I think they lost like million, millions of dollars worth of marijuana. Uh, this was back in the 80s. And, uh, you know, they ended up torturing him and killing him. Uh, which led to uh, some very serious. Oh, okay, I see some ones in the chat. Y'all know, y'all know what time y'all say it's still Team Six. Y'all know what time it is, baby. Uh, yeah, I'm working on getting y'all that interview. But yeah, anyway, with Kiki Camarena, yeah, he was tortured by uh, some car cartel people. If I'm not mistaken, the guy that killed him was uh, Caro uh, Caro Quintel, uh, Rafael Caro. Um, I forget his last name, but someone in the chat's gonna put put his name in here. I already know. Uh, and I'm just doing this off the top of my head. If I, I'm actually going to be very surprised if if, if it's uh, it's Rafael Caro Cantino or something like that. But anyway, yeah, I'll break down that case for y'all. Okay. Um, and I'm also going to break down a case. Speaking of uh, federal agents, uh, you know, be, being killed in the line of duty, I'm going to also going to do Jaime Zapata. Uh, I, as you guys know, I came from the Laredo field office, and Jaime Zapata was was a was a very good agent. He was uh, murdered in Mexico uh, by members of the Los Zetas. Uh, while he was do on a mission to deliver some equipment. And, you know, I know a lot of information on that because, you know, I knew agents that were close to him. So uh, I'm definitely going to do an episode on that and keep his memory alive. Um, and he ended up, the, the people that were involved in killing him got hit with murder. But again, like I said before, they got hit with murder because they killed a federal agent, right? So that was, it, that allowed the feds to come in and investigate that crime as a murder because he murdered, a they murdered a federal agent, okay? So typically... Murder, when the feds come in, has to be attributed to some other federal offense. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and start breaking this bad boy down. And uh, all you got to do, Autumn, just highlight the, the chats and stuff like that for, from this point forward for anything that comes in with like colors. Um, 
Shout out to her up and out in the background. Like the video, guys. We got 1,000 y'all in here. So, all right. So let's get right into it. All right. Uh, so we got Jeffrey Dahmer here. Uh, let me add. Let me move this tab. Moving some stuff around real fast for y'all. Okay. So I'm going to share screen. Because we got a lot to cover with our guy here. All right. So who is Jeffrey Dahmer? All right. Jeffrey Lano Dahmer. Okay. Here he is right here. Not a bad looking guy. Pause. Uh, born May 21st, 1960, no, uh, died November 28th, 1994, and we're going to talk about that as well. Also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster, was an American serial killer and sex offender who committed the murder and dismemberment of 17 men and boys between 1978 and 1991. Oh, man. Oh, shit! Many of his later murders involved necrophilia, cannibalism, and the permanent preservation of body parts, typically all or part of the skeleton. Okay, necrophilia, guys, is, you know, the sexual urge to have sex with corpses, and cannibalism is the consumption of humans, okay? And demonetization gone like that. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Although he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, just like a lot of these girls that come on the podcast, schizotypal personality disorder, a psychotic disorder, Dharma was found to be legally sane at his trial. He was convicted of 15 of the 16 murders he had committed in Wisconsin and was sentenced to 15 terms of life imprisonment on February 17, 1992. Dharma was later sentenced to a 16th term of life imprisonment for an additional homicide committed in Ohio in 1978. And gentlemen and ladies, this was the first murder he had committed, which we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail here in a second. And then on November 28th, 1994, Dahmer was being a death by Christopher Scarver, a fellow inmate at the Columbia Correctional Institute in Port Edge, Wisconsin. So for us to be able to understand the individual, we got to go back in time and understand what type of man this guy was, what was upbringing, what led to the creation of the Milwaukee monster. OK, so um, he grew up, guys, in Ohio. All right. And he grew up right here in this house, 4480 bath road um bath ohio and this is like uh pretty much right outside of akron okay nice home uh right now it's worth about four hundred fifteen thousand. uh but this home was built in 1952 and i got the redfin listing here guys because you know so we can get a little bit more details but this is the home right here okay it's been upgraded quite a bit um but uh so let's see here boom you guys can see here it's been pretty much enhanced all right um and now, I think nowadays, you can like rent the place for $10,000 a month, <laughs> which is wild. But that's kind of where we're at now, nowadays. There's a fascination with, um, with serial killers, all right? Um, and this is the inside of the home now, all right? And that residence has changed hands several times over the ensuing decades, including multiple times after the killer's 1991 arrest. And I mean, that's for obvious reasons, right? People are probably going to, you know, try to either, oh, I don't want to be here because someone died here because he committed his first murder here, guys, in 1978. All right. And uh, the seven year home has undergone extensive renovations since the days Dahmer lived there with recent listing photos showing the home complete with modern wooden flooring and stainless steel appliances. Musician Chris Butler bought the home for two hundred forty four thousand five hundred back in 2005 with the rock rocker telling the observer the house has a great vibe. I mean, after all, the house didn't kill anybody and I don't believe in ghosts and there's absolutely no reason to think there's anything untoward here. Butler put the home up for sale for $329 in 2020 in 2012 before later removing it from the market. Okay. Uh, and then this is the first murder victim, uh, Stephen Hicks, rest in peace to him. Uh, he was the first of one of Dahmer's 17 victims. Um, and then in 2014, the home was listed once again, this time for $299, uh, 300000 according to Zillow listing. The home once again failed to find a buyer and it was again taken down for sale. So I think the important thing you guys need to understand. So here is his mom. Okay. Joyce Dahmer, and here is his father, Lionel Dahmer. Um, so he grew up in an upper middle class home, okay? And his dad was basically a chemist, all right? And his mom was pretty much like a stay-at-home mom. But his mom was crazy, guys. Give me ones in the chat if you guys saw the Netflix series. Give me ones in the chat if you guys saw the Jeffrey Dahmer Netflix series. I just want to see kind of what the knowledge is on the chat about the parents. So I don't have to go into like too many details and be redundant if some of y'all didn't see it. One's if you saw it, two's if you didn't. One's in the chat, you saw the, uh, the, the dots. Oh, holy shit. Okay. All right. Resounding ones. Okay. A couple people didn't see it, but it looks like. All right. Y'all saw it? Okay. You guys were probably just as disturbed as I was. Like the goddamn video because I watched that whole, all 10 episodes. I had to fast forward through some parts because it was tough. But uh, like the goddamn video. So. 
anyway, so his mom, guys, had a bunch of issues. She was extremely erratic. She was using pills when he was uh, a child. And, you know, Lionel believed that a reason why um, Jeffrey, despite the fact that, you know, he didn't have any abnormal uh, abnormalities, you know, with his brain, he felt that she was the reason that he ended up being crazy, okay? And he put a lot of the blame on her. They had marital issues. They fought often. She pulled the knives on him. And this was all, I know this happened in the uh, in the Netflix series, but it was actually true, okay? Um, the, the, the Netflix series was actually fairly accurate according to what actually happened, okay? Um, yes, Jay Sudiger, I will do um, Ted Bundy in the future. Good, good, uh, good call, right? So, um, so he grew up, even though he, his family was stable financially, it was not stable emotionally, okay? And this is the importance of having the same parents, quite frankly, right? A lot of serial killers come up in fucked up homes. J Jeffrey Dahmer was one of the uh, few serial killers, right, that actually grew up in a two-parent household. But his father was away often, and his mom neglected him a lot. So Jeff had a lot of issues in school. Extremely, extremely awkward, very antisocial, didn't have friends. People made fun of him. Uh, one of the ways that he would go ahead and get validation from people when he was in school is that he would make noises, okay? And when I say he would make noises, he would act as though he was, um, how do I say this uh, without getting banned off YouTube? He would just act like he was retarded. Fuck it. You know, I'm just going to say it. He would act like he was retarded. He would make weird noise, right? And the people would like, ha, 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 and they laugh at him, right? But the key distinction here is that they wouldn't laugh with him. They would laugh at him and he would do that because he thought okay they were going to like me because i'm making them laugh but the reality is is that they would use that to you know ostracize him all right so that's kind of where he fell in the school situation obviously this isolation drove him a little bit to madness and he was drinking alcohol by the time he was a senior in high school guys the man was coming to school drunk as fuck okay my man was popping budweiser heavies popping bud <laughs> budweiser's right in class and you know one of his students one of the students actually uh his classmates asked him like what are you doing he's like this is my medicine and he's fucking just like pop one out and it's like started drinking it in class so he gave zero fucks man okay being drunk at seven o'clock in the morning all right so let me go through my notes here make sure i covered all that you have anything to say on, uh, on this autumn uh, with him and his uh, childhood and being being awkward I mean, bullying will do that to you, and then alcohol mixed with it, and a crazy mom. It's not a good combination. Facts. You, any, his mom remind you of any of your friends? My friends? Yeah, any of your friends crazy like his mom? Uh, maybe myself a little bit. Oh, shit. What the fuck am I doing? <laughs> 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 all right. So, um, all right. So, let's get into the first murder, guys, because that's he, he committed his first murder while he was pretty much still in high school, goddammit. So, the first murder, guys, happened in 1978 okay we're gonna go use this here because this gives a pretty good timeline of uh of his events all right so let's see here uh okay so so the first killing june 1978 and i think june 18th was the actual day um i was knew was wrong the first killing was not planned Dahmer told inside edition 1993 which by the way my ninjas i have the interview right here <laughs> I told you I'm not fucking around, all right? But yes, we're going to go through this interview as well. It was very revealing. And um, yeah, uh, all I'm going to say is that Jeff is not stupid, okay? He definitely isn't stupid. He's an intelligent individual from that, inter that interview. All right. I had fantasies about picking up a hitchhiker and taking him back to the house and having complete dominance and control over him. So let me uh, also let you guys know that Jeff was homosexual okay All right. if you guys haven't seen the documentary he was homosexual and what i will say as well is that this youtube video right here where is it um i had it here where'd it go it actually perfectly summarizes um his fetish for um what led to this and also he, he also when he was a kid as well guys one of his hobbies right since he was such a introvert was he would dissect roadkill all right and he'd look at the organs and kind of get the anatomy and it fascinated him so um his interest of looking at roadkill and looking at guts and you know looking at the shiny objects and the intestines etc alongside of his um homosexual tendencies 
kind of combined into to creating a, a monster, quite quite frankly. Um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, play this portion right here. This is from uh, the uh, real story. Shout out to them. Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee Cannibal Crime Documentary. And this guy right here is one of the investigators that was involved in interviewing and doing the case with um, against Dahmer, right? So he knows this guy very, very well. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and play this portion right here, because this nicely, uh, nicely and succinctly summarizes what kind of allowed Dahmer to mesh his two uh, two worlds collide: the homosexuality and the need for you know dissecting things. Matt Kennedy worked the beat in Milwaukee for over twenty-five years. Back in the summer of nineteen ninety-one, he was assigned to the Jeffrey Dahmer case, and spent six long weeks with him. He knew him better than most. He was a product of upper white middle class. He was <laughs> yeah on the chat saying he looks like Ron Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> he was educated. He came from um, a family of means. Yet the fractures in his parents' relationship left a young Jeffrey feeling isolated. And the fractures come from his dad always being gone and his mom being a fucking psycho, guys. His interests turned to animals. He viewed them very differently to how most children look upon their pets. He stated when he was a very young child, seven or eight, uh, he had found um, a decomposed squirrel. And uh, and also, I want you guys to, uh, to see that. So he started to get desensitized to dead animals and more importantly, dead smells as well. Right. Which this is going to be a, a, a recurring theme that you guys are going to hear later on uh, as far as like. From a young age, he was okay with seeing guts, blood, and smells. Because we all know roadkill stinks. It's really bad. However, from a young age, he already knew what time it was. The bones were there. He kind of took it apart. He uh, said that he found a roadkill, and he wanted to see what was inside it, like a raccoon or a dog. He brought that home. A dead dog that he found on the side of the road was hit by a car. Cut that open and looked at the insides of that. Jeffrey started to do this from a very young age. He would roam the surrounding countryside looking for roadkill to add to his growing macabre collection. His fascination with bones would continue into his adulthood, but he would eventually move from animals to humans. And this happens, guys. Um, this is fairly common with, with murderers, serial killers, people that end up uh, killing mass murderers, people that kill people and start to lose remorse. Uh, it almost always starts with the abuse of animals, okay? And uh, insects, animals, then you know, then a cat, then dogs and rabbits. Then the next thing you know, you're fucking chopping some dude's head off. This is kind of how, this is the trajectory a lot of the times of how a murder be, uh, uh, um, a murderer becomes murderer essentially. As he got to be about thirteen or fourteen, and he was coming into his um, sexual awareness, that uh, he uh, had. Uh, had some kissing with another boy in the neighborhood and he realized that he was attracted to boys becoming aroused sexually um and the cutting up of these animals somehow became enmeshed fair use my ninjas fair use so what he did as a young man with animals he eventually did do later on in life with human beings bam and there you go so um that right there, my friends, is kind of how everything was able to mesh together. So we're going to go over his first murder, okay? And it's interesting because this first murder happened when he was still a teenager, all right? So going back, um, the hitchhiker was 18-year-old Stephen Hicks, Dahmer's first victim. Dahmer took Hicks to his parents' house in Ohio, where he strangled and beat him with a barbell before dismembering the body and placing it in trash bags. No one, no one had a clue as to what was happening for over a decade. Let me, you know what, let me enlarge this for y'all real fast. You guys should be able to see that now. Okay. Um, no one had a clue as to what was happening for over a decade, Dahmer said, of what would transpire following his first killing. Dahmer would not murder again until 1987. So here's another picture of Stephen Hicks right here. Where was he killed? 448 West ba Bath Road, Bath Township, Ohio, which you, you guys know is this address right here, right? This home. And so basically, and the other th thing that you guys are going to notice about Dahmer is that he has serious abandonment issues. And what I mean by that is 
whenever he would, a lot of times he would kill his victims, okay, because he didn't want them to leave, okay? So he picks this guy up. He tells him, yo, I got some beer and weird weed at the house. I'm going to, you know, let's go hang out, etc." And the Netflix special makes it look like he makes a move on him. And then Dahmer ends up like, and he rejects him and then he walks out and then Dahmer tries to kill him. We don't know if that part is true, if, Dah if Dahmer actually tried to, you know, make a move on him sexually. But what we do know is that Hicks wanted to leave because he wanted to catch a, a, a rock concert that was going on about 25 miles away. And, <clears throat> and since Dahmer didn't want him to leave, he hit him with the dumbbell. He didn't think he was going to, he didn't have the intention of killing him though. He was more interested in keeping him there. And you guys are going to see that there's a common trend with these murders where they want to leave, they got shit to do, etc. And Dahmer wants them to stay with him. So killing them is a byproduct of his greed and him wanting them there and also him wanting to exert control. But the only way that he's going to be able to exert the control to the level that he wants is he needs to kill them, unfortunately, right? So that's what he came to realize. And you guys are going to notice, uh, see later on that he starts to implement other things, right? To try to not kill the individuals. All right. Um, so let's see here. Uh, to keep his new friend from abandoning him, an, an inebriated Jeff knocks Stephen unconscious with a 10 pound barbell weight just as the boy was bending down to pick up his jacket. Jeffrey decided this wasn't good enough for him or perhaps not permanent enough. So he knelt down next to Stephen's body and pressed the barbell weight into his throat until he had been strangled to death. He cut the boy into pieces and shoved it all into black trash bags, piling the remains in his car. I'll enlarge this as well so you guys could see more. And I went ahead, guys, and like I double checked this with uh, with other things, and this is probably one of the. It's nice and summarized, so that's why I'm using this. Uh, but I checked these. I double checked these facts for y'all. That night, he began driving the evidence of what he'd done to a local dump site. A police officer observed Jeffrey weaving over the center line of the road and proceeded to pull him over, asking him what he had in the bags and why he was out of state. Jeff explained by saying the bags were full of grass clippings and that he had been troubled by his parents' recent divorce and thought driving the trash out to the dump would take his mind off it. He managed to pass the field sobriety test and the cop unknowingly let her murderer carry the body parts of a young man go free. Shaken by the encounter, Jeffrey aborted the plan and instead drove back home and buried the bags underneath his house. Yo, shout out to that officer. <laughs> That is a L right there, my friends. Um, and you guys are going to see this, that Dahmer got lucky on multiple occasions with law enforcement interactions and getting away with it. All right. Yes. Grass clippings, Jonathan Hogu. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the Netflix series actually shows it where the officer says, hey, you're 18. I don't want to ruin your life. So go home. Get the fuck out of here. You know, whereas like nowadays, if you drive drunk, bro, with them dash cams, them boys taking you to jail. That's an L every single time. So don't drive drunk, guys. In 2022, I'm telling you, they're taking you in. They can't do it. They can't give you no favors because they got the dash cam on. All right. So. Um, so, yeah, he was able to uh, get out of the situation and he drove back home. Right. So this is Stephen Hicks right here. Rest in peace to him. He ended up uh, passing away. He was the only person that Dahmer killed in Ohio, okay? So um, after that, right, the next timeline of events is what happens is Dahmer, he goes off to Ohio State University, okay? He ends up flunking out, gets like a, not even a, he's like a 0.4, something like that, GPA. He's drinking all over the place. He can't necessarily, um, he can't, uh, he can't function, right? He fails all his classes. And his dad, had paid for him to go to school and get him an extra semester on top of that. But after just three months, he left, right? He got kicked out. So his dad, obviously furious, is like, motherfucker, you're joining the goddamn military. So he sends his ass to the military and he goes off, right? And uh, he joined the military in 1979 after his father made him. And he ended up becoming uh, a medic. In, in the military. Once again, what do, what, what do we know about this? He has an interest in, you know, human anatomy, dissecting people, etc. And he also gets introduced to, um, to drugs. Okay. Uh, drugs like Halcyon, etc. Right. The, which is a powerful sleeping pill, which is one of the things that he used to put people, uh, to sleep so that he can kill them. All right. And, um, and he went off to the military and, Obviously, uh, Jeff, uh, let's see here. I think I have a photo here somewhere <laughs> of him in the military, which is uh, hilarious. Uh, God damn it. Where did it go? I'm trying to find it for y'all. 
God damn it, did I lose it? I have it here. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, oh, here it is. I got it. But what, what are your thoughts on this so far from him being a fuck up with college and everything else like that on him? Um, it's just a sign that it's going to get worse. His life <laughs> is not going well, so it's going to start killing people, I guess. <laughs> and this sums up right here his uh, career in the military, guys. This is Jeffrey Dahmer in the military. <laughs> That's a big... This photo was taken of him in, uh, when he was in, I think it was in Germany. Um, and, you know, he has the bottle there, etc. So he ends up getting, guys, a uh, an honorable discharge. And, you know, your boy Myron ended up getting his military documents, a.k.a. So here he is right here, guys. I'm going to go ahead and enlarge this stuff for y'all. Okay. Um, here's his, obviously, here's his, you know, e, he was an E3. Here's a social security number. Some, please, guys, don't steal his identity. Uh, he's passed away now. Um, right. And it's a little bit faded, but here's his uh, signature, right, etc. cetera. Um, this is the Department of the Army Headquarters, 2nd Battalion, 68th uh, um, Armor, appointment of escort. This letter is to advise you that you have been appointed as escort for PFC Jeffrey L. Dahmer, uh, in, uh, private first class, who is now pending elimination under the provisions of AR 635-200. Um, and then they go ahead. Uh, this is basically, this probably went to one of the commanding officers over him to kick him off base after he had been um, hit with the, with the uh, discharge. And he got discharged on March 26, 1981. Um, uh, let's see here. And that's his number. Let's see. These are some more. My military guys know exactly what this is. But the point here, guys, is that he ended up getting an honorable discharge. Okay? He got an honorable discharge, um, which is honestly is, is wild to me because they kicked him out right here. Private Dahmer has had several alcohol incidents and is not willing to control his alcohol intake. I declare PFC Dahmer as a failure to the active and follow-up phase of the ADA PCP. There is a chapter nine pending on this service member. Um, and he was clinically evaluated for alcohol abuse, January 29th, uh, 1981. So he guys, um, and this is in New York, it looks like uh, 56 general hospital. Yeah. So he failed, he failed and they, and they kicked him out the military and he ended up getting an honorable discharge, which to me is crazy that he got an honorable discharge because typically for alcohol abuse, you would get a dishonorable discharge. Okay. But, uh, you know, getting a dishonorable discharge guys is I would argue worse than getting a, a felony, be, uh, uh, you know, being a convicted felon because you can't get no kinds of jobs with a dishonorable discharge. But here's the military documents you guys can see here. Right. Some more some more stuff. But you guys get the idea. So he ends up getting removed from the military. Right. With a with a honorable discharge in 1981. So after he goes to Miami Beach, spends some time there for a bit, um, he gets you know, he lives in a hotel. He's paying a little bit of mo money. He has like some odd job. I think he was like a butcher or something like that. Um, but he can't make it right. He doesn't make enough money. He gets kicked out of his place. He's living on the beach for a bit. He's like, fuck this shit, dad. I'm coming home. So his dad ends up taking him back. Right. So at this point, his dad's like, bro, like what the, <laughs> like, what are you doing? Right. Fucking failure. What are you doing? He's at, he's mad as hell, which rightfully so. I'll be pissed too. You try to send your son to college. He flunks out. You send him to the military, kicked out of the military for alcohol abuse. Right. So there's a trend here. Right. Because when he went into his dorm room at OSU, he saw liquor bottles all over the place. So Dahmer, guys, was a huge, huge, huge. Sound like Donald Trump, the G alcoholic. All right. That's an understatement. And uh, you guys say I'm kidding around when I say that, you know, Drinking alcohol is not in your best interest, et cetera, and getting, being a drunk. It really isn't, man. And am I saying that you're going to become uh, a serial killer with it? No. But but alcohol was definitely an ingredient to this craziness that was going on in his life, okay? When the police went to his apartment, there were butt heavies all over the place, empty cans everywhere, all right? And you can't – and actually, that was one of the main things that they used to establish that he was sane when he went to trial was that – he drank so much, right, to go ahead and knowing, knowing what he was doing was wrong. He drank so much to numb the pain of killing people and dismembering them and doing all the other crazy things he did to the corpses. Okay, so we got 1800 plus on here. Like the video. 
If you guys are just joining the podcast, quick little recap. <laughs> we went over who, uh, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer is. We went over his background. We went over his childhood. We went over his parents, his mom, his dad, and we went over his first murder in 1978. And then we went over and went into him going into the military and getting a discharge. Okay. So now guys, he gets sent to live with his grandma. Okay. AKA his, uh, father's, um, mom. All right. And that place was right here. This nice little neighborhood here in West Allis, Wisconsin. Okay, guys. And uh, here it is on Redfin as well, because your boy's a real estate investor. It's worth about 900, 193K uh, now. Man, I'm, it's off the market, though. I, I, mean, I, I will buy this. This ain't bad. All right. It's a 4,835 square foot lot. This home is currently off market based on Redfin's Milwaukee data. We estimate the home's value is worth 193K at the moment. But this is where his grandma lived, okay? And his grandma, uh, from his, his paternal grandma, uh, let's see here. So he goes to live with her, and the murders continue, guys, okay? So we're going to get into the rest of the timeline of his murders. So uh, Dahmer briefly returned to Ohio to live with his parents following his military discharge, but was arrested for drunken disorderly conduct for which he was fined and received a suspended jail sentence, hoping his grandmother would be a tempering influence uh, on their son's ongoing drinking. Dahmer's parents sent him to live with her in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. All right, arrested for indecently exposing himself at a Wisconsin state fair, Dahmer was convicted and fined 50 bucks. Uh, basically, what he was doing, guys, he was whacking off at a fair, right? AKA, that's another um, L. Dahmer. L. Dahmer's in the chat. Uh, August 1960, he's charged with disorderly conduct. Arrested for masturbating in front of two boys, Dahmer told authorities he was merely urinating, charged with disorderly conduct. He was sentenced to one year of probation and to undergo counseling. September 1987, uh, Dahmer kills his next victim nine years after his first. So, guys, this right here, my friends, is the turning point okay this is what sends him to becoming jeffrey dahmer the milwaukee monster after taking stephen tuomi 24 back to a hotel room dahmer says he awoke the following morning to find tuomi dead alongside him in bed dahmer would later tell authorities he had only planned on drugging tuomi and had no recollection of beating him to death with his fists placing the body in a suitcase. Dahmer transported it to his grandmother's basement where, a week later, he dismembered it and placed it in the trash except for the head, which he retained for a further week before boiling it in an industrial detergent and bleach, eventually pulverizing the brittle skull. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Oh, shit. So, here's another thing as well about him. A shout out to our boy fucking Trillstein in the house. <laughs> 200 bucks goes. Trillstein here. Myron, can you do R. Kelly part two? I'm a flirt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I already did R. Kelly. Go ahead and check out that episode if y'all want. I break down exactly why R. Kelly got 30 years. Um, but yeah, shout out to you, Mike uh, uh, Trillstein. So um, where was I? So yeah, so with Stephen Toomey, guys, here's the hotel that he took him to. Right here. Took him to the Ambassador Hotel in Milwaukee, which is right... Uh, God damn it, where is it? There we go. Here it is. Here's the Ambassador Hotel, guys. And uh, as you guys can see, we'll go ahead and street view right here. So this is it right here in Milwaukee. Um, nicer, nicer, nicer end hotel, I guess, at least back in the day, back then. Um, and this is where Dahmer took the guy because at this point, he had been kind of under the radar from the bathhouses, etc. So like people knew that he was doing some fuck shit. So he had to take the guy to the hotel to kind of avoid detection. All right, because he was going to bathhouses, right, to and drugging guys. All right, giving them that house in and putting him to sleep. And one guy almost had an overdose, so he had to figure out another way to get this guy back to where he needed him. All right, so he ended up taking him here to the Ambassador Hotel, which is where he would commit his second murder. And once that happened, guys, the floodgates were the floodgates were gone. All right, so <laughs> drunk Dahmer right here, and here's Stephen right here. This is him, all right? Oh, and it was, okay, room 507. I didn't even, there you go. They got it down to the room. Um, so he met him at a gay bar cl called Club 219, okay? And this club right here, guys, is right here. This is the club nowadays, right? It's now called the uh, Wall Street Stock Bar, right? All my Milwaukee people, y'all know, y'all know what it's like now. But this was it back in the day, if I can find it. Oh, right here. This was it back in the day. This was Club 209. It was a, it was a gay club, 
back in the day. All right. But this is where he met the met, met uh this guy Stephen. All right. Stephen Tumoy. And I apologize if I'm spelling it uh, mispronouncing it. Um they went back to his room, number 507, where they got blackout drunk. The next morning, Dahmer had no memory of the night before due to his drunken stupor, but found Tumoy hanging halfway off the bed with his chest brutally beaten in and blood seeping fr from his mouth. Dahmer left him immediately to buy the largest suitcase he could find, and he crammed Tumoy's body into it. Jeffrey rather boldly had the bellboy carry the heavy thing out of his out to his cab for him and route back to his grandmother's house, where he now lived. The cab driver made a comment about the nauseating odor emanating from the suitcase, which Jeffrey calmly brushed off. He let Tumoy's body rot for a week before dismembering him in the basement and destroying the remains. He was never charged for the murder of Stephen Tumoy because Stephen's body or any other physical evidence was never found. The sentencing judge refused to charge him without anything proving beyond a reasonable doubt that he did it. Additionally, Jeffrey held no technical memory of committing the crime. He stated that he probably did it, but he also offered the suggestion in a pathetic attempt to swerve responsibility that Stephen had killed himself. So, um, the other thing too, funny story that I want you guys to know as well. Shout out to uh, Michael Trostein again. I remember learning about Jeffrey and criminal justice, sick boy Trilla. Yeah, the, he, he's definitely sick with this stuff. Um, the other thing too, also guys, to just to go to show you guys how um, <laughs> crazy Jeff was and how he evaded, like he he just got lucky as hell. He basically like when when he was given the the bag over, the dude the cabbie was like, yo. Like was is what what's in here? A body? And Jeff was like, Yeah, there is a there is a body in there. And then they actually laughed it off, etc. But there really was a fucking body in there. So that's another little uh story that is um not a lot of people don't know about with the cabbie. But um, yeah, I mean, uh the thing is about Jeffrey Dahmer that I noticed from listening to his interviews and listening to him speak and you know, listening to him convey uh when he conveys himself to other people, uh he's very intelligent, he's very well spoken. He has a very um, monotone yet safe voice, if you know what I'm saying. He doesn't sound like an awful person, okay? He has that Milwaukee accent, right? And, uh, or that like Midwest accent, so you think that he's friendly. You know, they refer to soda as pop, right? That's, that's how people from the Midwest speak. Um, and it, it's a very disarming demeanor. But what people don't realize is once he gets you back into that apartment, apartment 213, aka or his grandmother's house, right? The demon comes out. Next thing you know, this dude turns into fucking. <laughs> and next thing you know, he's putting some fucking sleeping pills in your shit and he's trying to kill you. Right. So. um, So th th that's why a lot of people fell for his charm. All right. So uh, anyway, so let's go ahead. And we got uh, 2000 you guys in here. So do me a quick favor, man. Please like the video. If for anything else, like the video for the fact that I had to watch all 10 episodes of that Netflix series, and I was extremely uncomfortable every single time there was certain scenes going on. I don't care about the violence. I just did not like the, you know, the dudes tapping swords, if y'all know what I'm saying. All right. So like the video for that, because it was extremely uncomfortable watching that. And I know y'all know what I'm talking about in the chat for some of you guys that all hit those ones watching that, that Netflix joint. All right. So like the goddamn video if, if for anything else, just for that. All right. So, okay. So let's go back to the murders. We're going to go over all 17 victims because one thing I don't like is that the documentary didn't really show, not the documentary, excuse me. Well, the documentaries as well that are, that show this, but the Netflix series didn't show all 17 of the murders. They only showed uh, three or four of them, which I don't think is fair to the victims. So we're going to go ahead and go over each of them. All right. All 17, baby. And then we're going to also go ahead and play a portion of the Inside Edition uh, interview as well. So we're here for the long haul. So like the video. All right. Let me go back to share screen with y'all. Uh, do y'all see what I'm seeing? No, hold on. Okay, there we go. So here's the next um, the next victim. Okay. Uh, Dahmer murdered 14-year-old Jamie Doxler on January 16th, 1988. Jamie was hanging around outside of the popular gay club. Uh, 219, from where Dahmer also alerts Stephen Tumoy, unable to get inside due to him being a minor. He was known to frequently spend time around the club in search of romantic partners. Jeff obviously decided it would be easier to lure a child from the street than to lure a man away from the friends and atmosphere. So we offered Jamie 50 bucks to make a video with him at his house. Can you do me a quick favor, Autumn? Can you double check um, uh, what $50 was worth in 1988 to today? Just type in like inflation calculator, $50 in 1988. Um, just so that we could get it. Because I know somebody on the chat like $50. Like what? What? But you guys got to remember, inflation is a real thing. So what we're going to go ahead and figure out what it was really worth. And this is only a 14-year-old kid, man. 
Um, it was equal to $120.80. Okay. So, yeah. So that 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 changed it. So almost triple. Uh, together, they went back to Jeffrey's gar- grandmother's house where Dahmer drugged him, strangled him, and kept his body wrapped in a blanket in the wine cellar. For one week, poor Jamie's little body was left alone to rot on the floor. He then stripped the boy of his flesh, dissolved it, and crushed his bones using a sledgehammer. He threw out plastic bags containing the remains for the garbage truck to take to a dump site. All right, so recipes to Jamie. So let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, victim. Let's see here. Uh, so now we got uh, Richard Guerrero, March 1988. Richard Guerrero met his killer outside a Milwaukee gay bar. Dahmer offered Guerrero $50 to return to his grandmother's house and spend the night with him. After drugging Guerrero with his sleeping pills, Dahmer strangled him before performing sexual acts on the corpse. This time, Dahmer dismembered the body within 24 hours by hiding his killings, and the dismemberment was becoming increasingly difficult. Yeah, because at this point, his grandma starts to kind of figure out, like, what are you, Jeffrey, what the fuck are you doing? Okay, also, quick little story time for y'all. Rewind a, a bit. His grandma, guys, had caught him, like, sneaking in a mannequin, right? So he had stayed in a, in a department store overnight, right? He gets this mannequin, steals the mannequin, brings it home, puts it in bed with it, puts it in bed and he sleeps with it. And he's like touching the body and doing all this other strange, uh, you know, things. But the thing with the mannequin, why it helped him so much was that it didn't leave. It gave him that, that, that comfort of having some type of, um, so, some being with him. Right. And also mannequins guys back in the eighties before, you know, this whole body positivity bullshit, were actually in shape. Okay. So the mannequin fit the exact physical archetype that Jeffrey Dahmer liked, which was that V taper, muscularity, etc. So, yes. And his grandma found the mannequin, confronted him about it, and then she threw it out. And that drove him mad. Okay. And obviously, uh, since the mannequin was gone, right, that might have been the reason why he started doing this stuff where he like started becoming more active with going after people and getting them to tr- try to come back to his place and having sex with them and then, you know, uh, drugging them and killing them. All right. And this was all done again at his grandma's house right here. All right. Uh, also, this is it. And you guys look at the neighborhood, right? And let me show you all real fast. My bad. It was right here. If you guys look at the neighborhood, right, this is like a typical American dream white picket fence neighborhood in a good area, right? It's a suburb of Milwaukee that's very, very safe, unsuspecting, right? Well, man, you know, you come back to a place like this, you ain't thinking like, oh, yeah, this stew's about to put some sleeping pills in my joint and kill me and put me in the basement. You would never think that, right? You got a nice little granny upstairs. Like, you wouldn't think that. So, yeah. Yeah, someone said no driveway. Yeah, no driveway, bro, I guess. <laughs> oh, fun little fact for y'all. Jeffrey Dahmer did not have a driver's license, guys. He did not have a driver's license. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I know a lot of these like little random facts from all the research. All right. So let's continue on. Uh, um, so, yeah. So he killed uh, Jamie Doxer. And then, yes, this is, uh, this is uh, Guerrero right here. This is uh, Richard Guerrero right here. Here's a photo of him. All right. He was 23. Uh, he was 23. And the last time they saw him was on the evening of March 24, 1988. And this was... Um, they offered him 50 bucks and he didn't have money. Look, as you can see, he only had $3 to his name. So he agreed to go to Jeff's offer, probably grateful for the money. Dahmer drugged, strangled, and sexually assaulted Guerrero before dissolving his body using an acid solution and flushing the consistency down uh, the toilet. After Dahmer's final arrest, Richard's sister, Janie Hagen, broke America's heart by pleading, I want to know what he did with my brother. I heard on the news that he may, that maybe my brother had been flushed down the toilet. I want to know. She would never get an answer because Jeffrey never told her and the boy's remains were never discovered. Now, next one is uh, Kaizen Synthesomphone, okay? And I'm probably butchering that, and I apologize. Um, This guy actually wasn't killed. He was only attacked, all right? So he was a 13-year-old boy that Jeffrey lured into his first apartment less than 24 hours after moving in. So now, guys, right? So he committed two murders at his grandma's house, right? He killed killed Stephen Tumway. So a little quick... now we're up to like murder four or five here. So he kills Stephen Hicks, first murder, 1978, at his parents' home, okay? Right? And also, I just want to make a quick little note of this as well. I forgot to mention this. When he killed Stephen Hicks, his parents were nowhere near, weren't found. His dad was living at a hotel, and his mom left with his brother, 
Okay, so he was living by himself for several months, but for about three to four months, he was by himself living at the house, going to school drunk as fuck, not knowing what the hell was going on. So he had the house to himself. Okay, so that's how he was able to commit this murder of this guy. And no one knew. Nobody knew. As a matter of fact, they didn't know that he killed them until he confessed to the police. All right. So the first murder at his home, second murder, ambassador hotel. All right. Which we discussed before. Third murder committed at his grandma's house. Fourth murder committed at his grandma's house. Now he brings them back to his uh, to his apartment, all right, his first apartment, which is uh, 808 North 24th Street. Um, uh, let's see here. And I don't think, is this correct? Because it was supposed to be 924 24th Street. Is it 808? Can you double double search that for me? Just do a quick fact check on that for me, um, Autumn. Uh, give me one sec, guys. All right, there we go. So um, he lured him into the first apartment at less than 24 hours after moving in. Kaiser was drunk and molested, but managed to escape and quickly found police. Jeffrey was charged with sexual assault and enticing a child for immoral purposes, spending one week in jail before posting bail. Who was sentenced to four months later, pleading for mercy by standing, stating that he was an alcoholic and homosexual with sexual problems and offered the transparent excuse that he thought Kaizen was 19 years old. Okay, come on, Jeff. Stop the cap. Uh, he received a light term of five years probation and one year in a workers' release program, forcing him to move out of his new apartment. Mr. and Ms. sent the cell phone were promised that the man who traumatized their son would be locked away for a long time. So they chose not to take the case to court. They never found out what Jeffrey looked like, leaving Kaizen the only person in the family that would be able to identify him. And also, just so y'all know, you guys are probably wondering, where did he work? Well, he worked at, let me see if I got the pictures here. No, that's not it. Bear with me, guys. Sorry. I have a lot of stuff here. Okay. This is where he worked. He worked at a chocolate factory, guys. All right. Which is right. This thing is being slow. Bear with me. Okay. This is the apartments, right? This is where he brought all his victims, which, by the way, this apartment complex is gone now. Okay. The Oxford Apartments. But this is where he worked. Ambrosia is a chocolate factory. All right. The former Ambrosia Chocolate Co. in downtown Milwaukee, where serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer worked in the 1980s. The building is now gone. And um, this is where he was working on that work release program. All right. So um, your chocolate is more than likely being made by a convicted felon somewhere in the U.S. <laughs> like the video for me, guys. All right. So this guy actually survived. Next, we got... Um, uh, what was his name? On March 25th, 1989, Easter Sunday, while Jeffrey was a free man awaiting trial for sexually assaulting 13-year-old Kaizen, he went out to hunt once again at Lakaj Ox Falls, a local gay bar. Here he met an aspiring model, 26-year-old named Anthony Sears, and successfully conned him into coming home with him. Jeff knew the police were probably keeping tabs on his apartment while he awaited trial, so Anthony had a friend, Jeff Connors, drive the pair to Dahmer's grandmother's house where he dropped them off, not before reminding Anthony that he was meant to have uh, lunch with his mother the next day and to call if he needed a ride. Dahmer then escorted Anthony inside where he drugged, strangled, and dismembered him. Dahmer admittedly found Sears to be exceptionally attractive, even scalping him because he loved his ponytail. Oh my God. Oh shit! Oh shit! He was truly mesmerized with Anthony so much so that he took his skull to work with him uh, a few days after so that he could take breaks throughout his shift to gaze at it. He later said, if I could have kept him longer, all of him, I would have. Three years later, investigators found Anthony's skull, mummified scalp, and preserved penis inside of apartment 213. So, as you guys can see, this guy wasn't all there, right? Um, yeah, I, I can see on the chat going wild. Dahmer, right, and I also want to make this very clear for y'all as well, was very physical with his murders. And what I mean by this is that he went after very good-looking men, and he would bring them back to his place, and he wanted them to stay with him. And the only way that he can execute them staying with him was typically he would drug them and then he would strangle them, right, while they were asleep. Because, I mean, in his interviews, he says he didn't want them to feel pain like that. He just wanted them to be with him. And he would, and, and, and you could see that him killing them, dismembering them, holding parts of their bodies, right? And then at some, uh, eventually he starts eating parts of them, okay? This goes to show the deep, need to keep people right uh 
Someone put in the chat. <laughs> Someone. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you guys have no fucking chill, bro. <laughs> Yo, what the fuck? <laughs> uh... <laughs> Yo Yo <laughs> Yo What the fuck man <laughs> uh, Okay thank you for taking that off the screen Yo, I'm fucking crying. Yo. Yeah. Shout out to Elmira on breaking down. It's not funny. This is very serious. No, not funny to you. You, you Miss Dark. No, I know you. Let's stop it. Miss Dark Humor. I know you fucking laughing. You should, she capped it right now. She was laughing the whole time. She just was laughing away from the mic. <laughs> oh, man. I'm fucking crying over here. Shout out to El Myro and Break It Down Cases and Facts. Uh, special shout out Big Mo uh, Big, uh, and Rod Eric. Mod, congrats on winning the 1000 for Tristan Tate. Yeah, shout out to our man Tristan Tate, man. All right. Y'all totally threw me off what the hell was going on. Uh, what was I talking about? Yes. So Dahmer had uh, a deep need to keep people with him. And then the, his victims that he picked were typically attractive, right? And had certain physiques. So he would go and escalate and to keeping him with him uh, through preserving uh, body parts. Next, we got uh, uh, on May 20th, 1992, two weeks after moving into the now famous apartment 213 at Oxford Apartment Complex, Dahmer approached 33-year-old Raymond Smith, also known as Ricky Beaks at Club 219. Per his usual, Dahmer offered him money to come home with him to drink and take nude photographs where he then drugged Raymond, strangled him, and had oral sex with his corpse. Oh, God. Oh shit! Oh shit! Dahmer then dismembered the man, placing his severed head in the refrigerator afterwards and dissolving his body in acid. He used Smith's bones as decor throughout his hellish apartment. Dahmer later stated that Raymond uh, Raymond's was the first corpse he had sex with. Okay. Um. Did you end up figuring out that other apartment number? Uh. Autumn. I have or? not found it yet. I don't. Here, know here let me here let me give you the address one more time. It's eight oh three or sorry eight oh eight North Twenty Fourth Street. 808 and heartbreaks. Just kidding. 808 North 24th Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah, let me see if that because because that that would mean that he had a, a, another uh, apartment prior, which I did not know about. I didn't know that he lived anywhere else besides the Oxford apartments uh, that we all know from uh, the documentaries, etc. <clears throat> so next he had uh, Edward Smith. All right. Uh, Eddie Smith, uh, 36 years old, deemed chic by his friends, was the life of the party everywhere he went. Fun-loving, kind-hearted man. He was what you might call friends with Dahmer. Before subsequently becoming his victim, he'd hung out with Jeffrey at his apartment. Hold on one second, guys. He hung out with Jeffrey at his apartment on multiple occasions, always having a great time. On the evening of June 14, 1990, Eddie left a Milwaukee joint called the Phoenix Bar and met with Dahmer sometime just after that, which was also another gay bar in the area. On the particular visit, Jeffrey gave him a glass of liquor spiked with strong sedatives, and he soon fell unconscious. From there, Dahmer strangled his friend to death before cutting the flesh from his bones with a knife and dissolving his body in the 57-gallon drum of muriatic acid. He used Eddie's bones as decor throughout his apartment, as he often did with his excuse me, with his victims. During dress trial, a relative of Eddie's mourned all Edward Smith wanted was to be Dahmer's friend. Yeah, very, very sad stuff. And you guys can see here that he kind of has a trend. And what he does, guys, a lot of his game was, hey, come back with me, take pictures. Hey, come back with me, have drinks. Hey, come back with me. I have this and that. And then once he gets him into the apartment, which, by the way, he had like nine different locks on that door, guys, right? He would go ahead and transform into something else. And he would go ahead, <laughs> right? And get extremely aggressive, turn into Scorpion in this bitch. Get over here! And then next thing you know, finish him. And then fatality. Yeah. So 
uh let's see here do we have any uh chats i'll go ahead and uh pull up any any uh chats real fast hey guys thank you so much for the donations man like i said before put a lot of work into this thing uh so i'll go ahead and pull up some of these chats here <laughs> And you have he, anything you want to tell the, uh, Autumn? What are your thoughts so far? Go ahead. Well, I found that he did live there for a short period uh -huh. um, in 1988. Okay. It says after pleading guilty to charges of second degree sexual assault, uh, he moved back in with his grandmother. Okay. And then he went to the, the Oxford Apartments? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Um, so real quick, guys, we got, I'll hit some, some of these chats real fast. All right. We got Christian Garcia, five bucks uh, goes great work. Thank you so much. Uh, Big Mo, B-I-T-W, this is, he goes, this is the week we'll be unleashing the power of Viking to shift the paradigm of the world. Yeah, shout out to Viking. He's going to be helping us out with the internet. Um, and then we got uh, Christina Brownlee, Top G meets Bottom G, yes sir, yes. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Top G meets Top Jew, yes sir, yes. That's from Mike James. Um, Philly Area, 279, thank you so much. Uh, a little Cray Cray goes, <laughs> and they actually used your screen, your picture too. That's creepy. <laughs> uh, I told you, man. The chat is is ruthless. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike James, message twenty three. Can I? I can be a little cray for you. What's your SSN? Okay. Uh, give Candace a, ra a raise, Trill. Okay. Uh, Mike James. Uh, that was from before. Okay. Chris goes twenty bucks. Hey, Myron. Do you think people are born serial killers, or is it developed environmental? Different kind of evil. Crazy to think life can get to that point. Um. Honestly, bro, I don't think people are born serial killers. I think it's developed. You know, I think some people are going to be more prone to crime than others, but I don't think, I, I personally don't think that um, that uh, people are born serial killers. Because um, you guys, the other thing too I want to say is like serial killing is kind of like an American thing. You leave the United States, bro, like you don't really see the same uh, serial killers with the same uh, prevalence, you know, with the same, same amount of prevalence. Like, uh, I, I'll, I might break down a case for y'all on this, and there was this guy that was doing serial killings in 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 the in um Europe, right? Back in like the uh, 90s. And the investigators didn't know what the fuck was going on. They were like, what the hell's going on here? They had to go and reach out to the FBI, right? The criminal profiles, profilers, to kind of like figure out, like, yo, we got a serial killer. We don't know what to do. So serial killers is kind of like an American thing. Now, does that mean that Europe doesn't have serial killers? Of course there's gonna be serial killers, right, in other places, but it doesn't have the same prevalence as it does as the United States. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. You know, people say the interstate highway system was res is responsible, you know, um, feminism, the degradation of the, of the family. There's so many different things that play into it. All right. I knew you guys were going to say Jack the Ripper. Yes, guys, Jack the Ripper. But that, that's, that, that was a long time ago, man. We're talking about like the 1800s. This dude was running around slashing people up. Um, okay. Let's see here. Uh, we got here. Can you do an episode on Max B? And that's from Rich. Two bucks. Uh, I could. That, that one's going to take some time, though. CKB goes, five bucks. Myron, why do most serial killers start off by killing animals? In the show, Domro is beating his meat over a fish he killed. Uh, that's a good question, bro. It, it, it typically escalates from there. Just like, you know, when you watch porn, right? A lot, pause. What happens is you no longer get aroused by like just regular sex. You start watching like more and more crazy stuff. That's why people watch gangbangs and, you know, weird shit, you know, on porn. That's why I tell y'all don't watch porn because a lot of guys have erectile dysfunction because regular girls no longer do it for them, right? They can't even get off banging their girlfriends or, 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 or a girl because they watch so much porn, they're desensitized to it. So, um, I would say it's so similar to that. Uh, Jay Sudiger, uh, Ted Bundy. Yes, I will. Antonio Wing Chun. Sub FNF. Can you do an update video on Coach Red Pill in Ukraine? I can. I'll reach out to him. Um, Myron's grandfather. Uh, proud of you for working on my biopic. Inshallah. Thanks, Myron's grandfather. And it's a picture of Bin Laden. You guys are fucking assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait for one million when you expose these ass clowns. That's from CKB. This guy 9947 goes. Any chance we can get to review the DEA up? Oh, read that one. Okay, cool. I think we're caught up on the super chats, guys. Thank you so much for all the donations. I love y'all. There's 2,300 you guys watching the show. Before we get back into it, uh, Autumn, you have any thoughts on what's going on? Before I get uh, continue um, on, just curious to hear more. Let's get into it. All right, cool. Uh, so, <clears throat> so uh, the next victim, okay, was let's see here, um, this guy. All right. So Ernest Miller was a 23 year old dancer when he met Jeffrey Dahmer outside of a bookstore. The same one Dahmer would go on to meet yet another victim at and got invited to his apartment under the pretense that he would be paid $50 to pose nude for Dahmer's beloved Polaroid camera. 
Shortly after arriving and beginning to prepare the drinks, Dahmer realized that he only had two sedatives left. He usually used three. He decided to go ahead and use the ones he had, and Miller fell unconscious after enjoying his drug drink. Presumably because of the smaller dosage, his chemically induced slumber didn't last very long, and he woke up shortly after. Dahmer panicked, not wanting to leave, and fatally stabbed him in the throat with a knife that was laying nearby. He then hovered over Miller's body, taking photographs of this Polaroid camera as the young man lay on the carpet, bleeding to death. Dahmer dissolved his body in acid, except for the bi biceps, which were wrapped and put in the freezer, soaked his bones in bleach, and kept the entire skeleton in his closet. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Oh, shit. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, guys. Uh, as you guys can see, right? You can see, you guys can see the, pro the, um, pro the progression in violence and, um, and being more uh, overt with his acts and keeping different body parts, okay? So, yeah, this is wild stuff right here. Oh, oh did I just... God damn it. Where do we go here? Let me... Give me one second, guys. Refresh this thing. I was trying to make it bigger for y'all and I ended up messing it up. Okay. So where were we? We were here, okay? And I'm going to show you guys pictures of his apartment here uh, soon. All right. So on September 24, 1990, David Thomas was hanging out at the mall after a couple relatives had dropped him off when he was first approached by Dahmer. Thomas was a 23-year-old man from a good family that he was close with, and he had two children that loved him. While chatting with each other at the mall, Dahmer somehow convinced Thomas to accompany him back to his apartment. Once there, Dahmer gave him a sedative lace drink, and he was soon unconscious. Uh, in a sudden change of mind, Jeffrey decided that Thomas wasn't his type. Fearing the retaliation he would most likely receive if he let him if he let him sleep it off, Dahmer decided to strangle him to death anyway. Afterwards, he performed his usual routine of dismembering the man, which he video recorded and took photographs of this the, before dissolving the flesh in acid, keeping the full skeleton in his closet next to the skeleton of Ernest Miller. Okay. From Thomas, he also saved the biceps and wrapped them in plastic bags to be placed in the freezer. These two placed next to Miller's. The extremely graphic polarized Jeffrey took of the dismemberment process or what Thomas's sister ended up having to identify his body with. Oh, my God. So, wild. So, we're on victim. What are we on now? Okay, so he is... Hold on, let's keep count here. All right, so one, two, three, four, five. No, well, this one doesn't count. The five, six, seven, eight, nine... So now we're on 10, all right? Curtis Strutter was a 19-year-old aspiring model patiently waiting at the Milwaukee bus stop on February 18, 1991 when Dahmer approached and lured the boy to apartment 213 to take nude photos promising $50. Curtis is the only victim of Dahmer's that, didn't, uh, that he didn't drug first. Instead, Dahmer immediately strangled the young man with his belt while receiving oral sex from him, then dismembered him. He kept uh, um, Strutter's skull to preserve after crushing the rest of his bones, disposing the boy's remains in the dump. So you guys can see... The progression here in violence and, and, you know, and just recklessness. Errol Lindsay was another unfortunate 19-year-old boy that agreed to pose nude for Jeffrey's camera in exchange for $50. They began talking in April 1991 outside of the same bookstore Dahmer lured Ernest Miller away from six months prior, and the situation played out for Errol in the same way. He fell unconscious after consuming a drug drink, but this time Jeffrey wanted to try out an experiment he had in mind. He had decided that he wanted a living companion that lacked conscious thought rendering them completely submissive to Jeffrey. That was another thing about uh, Dahmer, guys. He was really big on being dominant and having control. That was the main stimuli for why he committed the crimes that he committed. He didn't want them to leave. He wanted to keep them there, and he didn't care how it was done. He wanted to make sure that he was always the one that was being dominant, okay? So if that meant killing him, hey, he looked at it like, yo, that's a means to an end, all right? He had decided he wanted a living companion that lacked conscious thought, rendering them completely submissive. Je Jeffrey attempted to achieve this for the first time by power drilling a hole into Errol's skull while he was passed out and injected muriatic acid into his brain. Errol woke up likely due to his skull being drilled into, but was acting perfectly fine. He knew where he was and who he was. Jeffrey, in a moment of frustrated failure, drug Lindsay once more and strangled him to death. Dahmer then had oral sex with a young corpse before dismembering him and disposing of the body. He kept Lindsay's skull as a sick reminder of the event. Lindsay's sister gained slight fame after her victim impact statement at trial due to the fact that she ch charged at Dahmer, screaming, I hate you, Jeffrey, and hurling expletives at him. It took five burly officers to hold a small woman back from killing Jeffrey with her bare hands. Do me a favor, Autumn. 
pull up his sister's um his sister's uh wildness uh, uh, or her uh, like her coming after Dahmer in the court. I, I want the audience to see that. Uh type in um Errol Lindsay sister. Errol Lindsay's sister your sister Jeffrey Dahmer it's going to come up. She had like a 100% black t-shirt on when she ran at him. And it's also shown in the, in the in the Netflix series as well. But this guy so I mentioned this before that um so at this point, right? Dahmer wants the people to stay with him. He realizes that yo, you know, killing these guys, you know, I get it. I'm killing them. I'm getting to them to stay with me, but it's not the same. I want them to be with me but be here still alive to some degree. I want them to be my sex zombie is how he would refer to it, right? So what he tried with Errol Lindsay, which was the first time he had tried this, was taking a drill, drilling into their skull, right? About 2 to 3 inches in, past the skull into the brain almost. Then what he did was put muriatic acid in there and he thought right in his twisted mind that this would make them like alive and kind of there but like like not really conscious right they were just there to be his sex slave and he realized that this doesn't work right he thought my dad was a chemist i think i could figure this out i got this i was a former medic for the military i can figure this out and it ended up being a big it was an L quite frankly. And uh, it didn't work on Errol Lindsay. And he ended up killing him. But he's going to try this again, as we're going to get into later on. Uh, were you able to find that? Um... Yeah, I got a video that compares like the Netflix to the actual thing. Okay, yeah, let's show the actual thing if we can. I'll go ahead and pull it up on screen. Do you have it ready? Yeah, it's like both of them in one video, though, like on top of each other. Okay, yeah, pull uh, pull it up on screen real fast or and then and then and then start playing it and then i'll share share your screen when you have it um okay so that's er, uh and then that's errol Lindsay. okay that's his that's his death so next we're gonna get into uh anthony hughes now this one guys they did an entire episode on on him in the netflix series so a lot of you guys that watch the show are probably going to be familiar with this individual you have it mm -hmm. cool all right so i'm going to go ahead and show screen for y'all real fast before I do this, of um, the uh, the Netflix series versus the um, the actual situation. Now, hmm, I don't know if they're if it's gonna play sound. You hit play on it real fast. I don't think they're gonna hear it, hear it. Yeah, they're not gonna hear it. So do me a favor. You know what? See that link? Where? Okay, and you got that from YouTube, right? yes okay so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna actually pull it up for the people because i just realized that if we pull it up from there it's not gonna have it's not gonna have uh sound so let me pull it up real quick for the audience guys give me one second bear with me here i'm pulling it up for y'all uh it's called read it for me one more time the, the title um, rita isbell's 1994 statement in netflix Dahmer dash monster bam okay i got it right here for y'all no one the hell why are they showing me a goddamn short i don't care about that my name is okay bam all right so let me go ahead and share a screen with y'all so y'all see this all right cool as rita isbell and i'm the oldest sister of errol Lindsay. jer whatever your name is satan i'm mad this is how you act when you are out of control now i don't want to ever have to see my mother go through this again and you guys can see, obviously, very emotional, very mad. And it, it, I'm not going to lie. The actress that did this played it very well compared to the original video. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, motherfucker. I hate you. This is out of control. And also, I want to say this as well. The actor that played Jeffrey Dahmer was fantastic. Really good. Like, I, I, I'm actually very, very impressed. I would, I would put it close to you know Heath Ledger's performance in Dark Knight. He was very very good cuz even when I listened to the Jeffrey Dahmer tapes, I listened to the Jeffrey Dahmer interviews, the actor sounded just like him. The fact that he was able to um use have his same accent, sound like him, speak like him, use the same tonality, use that same monotone type um ambiance in his speaking, it was it was incredible. The actor that I mean hell, even when they were having those uh those homoerotic scenes, 
the the actor did a really good job of making it look legit, which made me really uncomfortable. So hey, kudos to you, my friend. You gotta give him a Don Marco, Marco real quick because he did a Marco. damn good job. Don't fuck with me, Jeffrey. I'll kill you, goddammit. Look at me. Look at me. My name is Rita Isbell. Yeah, so let me see if I can get the original, like the real one. So y'all saw the the that one. All right, this is the victim statements here. Let me find hers. This is from Court TV. They would make me sift through 30 minutes of this crap. I got you. I'm going to find it, though. Oh, here we go. Bam. When you are out of control. Oh, look, she's the most she's the most replayed. <laughs> I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, mother. I hate you. Jeffrey, out of control. Don't me, Jeffrey. I kill you, goddamn it. Look at me, mother. I'm gonna kill you. What's your name, sir? I'm gonna kill you. Yeah. So yeah, she actually did a uh, she she actually did a very um, good rendition uh, compared to <laughs> the the actress and uh, that did it on um, on the Netflix series. Very close. Pretty damn good. <clears throat> so let's see here. All right, let me uh, go back here. Okay. So shout out to you for finding that video, by the way, Autumn. Guys, do me a favor. Like the video, by the way. We got 2,400 of y'all in here, man. Y'all could be anywhere else in the world, but you're here doing the Jeffrey Dahmer breakdown with me, which I appreciate that you guys are here. Took me quite a bit of time to prepare this thing for you guys. So thank you so much for being here. So, all right. So let's go ahead and go into uh, Hughes, okay? Um, and this one, guys, they did a full episode on him. Um, uh, Anthony Hughes uh, was a 31-year-old deaf and mute man who's and was accidentally met at the hands of Jeffrey Dahmer. They had known each other for a while. Tony was a popular guy. He knew sign language and could read lips, never letting his disabilities get in the way. According to Dahmer's account of the evening, he had passed a note to Tony at a gay bar, offering him $50 to come hang out at his apartment, presumably suggesting he model for nude photos, to which Tony wrote back, sure. Since he was deaf and mute, guys, that's the way he communicated. He would pull out a little notebook, and he would write everything down and then pass it across. Tony's mother slammed Jeffrey's statement during his trial, exclaiming that Tony had $400 when he left home that day and didn't need his $50. Inside Dahmer's apartment, he rendered Tony unconscious with crushed sedatives hidden in his drink. Dahmer then drilled a hole into his skull and injected acid into the cranial cavity while he was knocked out. His second attempt at experimenting on a victim to try and create a sex slave zombie. His first attempt was on his most recent victim from a month prior, Errol Lindsay, but Lindsay woke up seemingly unaffected, so Dahmer strangled him. In Tony's case, the acid injection killed him. Jeffrey claimed he didn't intend to kill him, but rather he hoped for Tony to become a zombie-like. Dahmer left the innocent man's corpse rotting in the bedroom for several days before dismembering him and dissolving his body and asked that Dahmer kept Tony's skull to add to his disturbing collection. Also, just want to let y'all know, his body was there, guys, when the police ended up finding this kid, okay, this guy right here, uh, Conorak uh, Synthes Suffamon, who is the brother of this guy from earlier who was attacked, as you guys as, as you guys know. Um, God damn it, where is he? Him. All right. Kaizen. These guys were brothers, guys, which makes this even more incredible. And here's the other thing, too. Dahmer didn't know that this dude was brothers with uh, Conorak. Okay, he didn't know that. So in the in the Netflix series, it, it, you know, uh, Conorak tells him, "Oh, you got in trouble for messing with my brother before." But um, but the truth is, is that from the Dahmer interviews, he's saying that he didn't know that. And you know what? I'm gonna believe Dahmer, and the reason why I'm gonna believe him is because he confessed to everything. He helped the detectives find the bodies. He had nothing to really hide. He confessed to everything. So I think Netflix did that more for entertainment purposes. But um, but yeah. So, and this is the famous boy, by the way, that was found naked running uh, in the streets of Milwaukee that the police gave back to Dahmer. So let's go ahead and read this one. Con and rest in peace to him, man. This is literally heartbreaking. 
Uh, Connor Act 14 was murdered by Dahmer on May 27, 1991. Coincidentally, his brother Kaizen was drugged and molested by Jeffrey one year prior. But Kaizen escaped and Jeffrey was charged with sexual assault and enticing a child. The following year, Dahmer spotted the younger sibling at Grand Avenue Mall, neither one realizing who the other one was. Also, in the, in the Netflix series, they show that Dahmer is going to go pick up alcohol and Connor Act is outside the, out the liquor store trying to get alcohol. That is not true. They actually met at the mall. So uh, Netflix L. <laughs> And he offered Conrack $50 to come back with him to his place. He drugged Conrack with what was li likely Xanax and raped him before drilling a hole in his skull and injecting muriatic acid into his brain. The child remained unconscious and Jeffrey grew frustrated that his experiment had failed once again. So he left and spent a few hours drinking at a bar nearby. While Dahmer was get out getting uh, uh, intoxicated, Conrack woke up and managed to escape apartment 213, stumbling into the street naked, beaten, lobotomized, bleeding, and barely able to see, think, or stand. When Dahmer returned, he found Conrack sitting with two black women who were uh, tending to the traumatized kid. He tried to drag Conrack back to the apartment with him, but while Conrack fought against him, the police pulled up. The worried women had called 911 explaining that a naked and badly beaten child was wandering the street, wandering the street and in need of help. Dahmer told the police that the Laotian boy was a 19-year-old lover named John Hamung, who had been too drunk I had too much to drink, and he, uh, as he had did from time to time, and the policeman laughed it off as a drunken lover's quarrel, even as the women cried out in protest. Conrack was unable to explain or defend himself due to the drugs in his system and experimentation performed on his young brain just hours before, leaving him completely incoherent. Additionally, he didn't know how to speak much English without any other... Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that he didn't speak a lot of English, but that makes sense because his parents were immigrants. Without any other real defense, he refused to get up and go with Jeffrey, so the police picked him up by the arms and carried him to apartment 213. Here, Conrack's clothes were folded neatly, and Jeffrey showed the officers a couple photos of the boy in a pair of black underwear as proof of their relationship. Satisfied, the police left the apartment. As soon as they were gone, Jeffrey injected another shot of acid into the frontal lobe of the child's brain, killing him. Uh, can you do me a favor, Autumn? Can you pull up uh, the police um, dispatch? What they said after they left the, the thing, just type in like police, Connor Rack, um, left Dahmer's apartment or something like that. It's going to show what they said. Um, a few days later, a newspaper story was released in regards to a missing Laotian child. Glenda Cleveland, the mother of one of the two girls that tried to protect Connor Rack, called the police department to tell them the boy from a two days ago prior looked like the missing boy from the paper. No one was ever sent to talk with her about it. Rest in peace. Yeah, that's extremely sad. This is probably the most heartbreaking one. Uh, was uh, was that uh, Conorak being uh, killed because the police were literally there. And that is a second example where police had the chance. Actually, this is the third time that um, Dahmer had a brush in with the law and made it. The first time was after he killed Stephen Hicks in 1978, was driving with trash bags with his dismembered cut up body and the police let him go right for after he was swerving in lanes. Number two was when he got arrested and convicted for molesting a child, which was Conrack's brother. He only got one year in prison and he got to work at a chocolate factory, right? Willy Wonka type shit. And then third was he, Conrack, escaped from the home. The police show up and they let Dahmer take him back to the apartment. So all I'm going to say for those two police officers, because what I will say as well, why this was a monumental L from those police officers was if they had run Dahmer's name, right? They would have seen that he was a sex offender, a convicted sex offender. And if they had done their due diligence, they would have probably been able to figure out that the, 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 the child was a minor. Okay. Connor Act was a minor. So they didn't do their homework, you know, and you also got to know, and this isn't to, cause the police fucked up. I'm not even going to give them uh, an out on this one. Um, the reason why uh, the police were so lazy on this was because number one, it was a it was a shitty neighborhood. Number two, right? The police had issues with the homosexual community at this time. This is the early '90s, guys. You guys got to remember as well. We need to also look at the climate. There was a lot of negative stereotypes about homosexuals back at this time. You know, HIV, AIDS. You know, they didn't want to necessarily associate and or stay in the apartment for a long time. One of the officers made a stupid, crude joke about getting deloused, deloused, deloused or something like that after being at the apartment. So. Um, so they didn't want to be there. They didn't want to do their due, their due diligence and investigate the crime properly because number one, 
it was a bad neighborhood. Number two, they were homosexual and they didn't want to come off as, you know, being biased. Number three, they didn't want to be around them in general because there was this negative stigma that gay people all had HIV and or AIDS. And if you hung around them, you can catch it too. And I know that's like, what? Like, Myra, what the fuck? Like, what? Hey, guys. What the fuck? Back in the early 90s, no one knew. It was new. It was a new disease. So no one knew how it was. It, it was, um, uh, it was, um, no one knew where number one where it really came from right they just thought gays only had it number two they didn't know how it was transmitted and then number three there wasn't enough education on it so that was the that was the atmosphere in the 90s so these all all these factors led to them saying oh you know what they're gay uh we don't want to deal with this whatever and they didn't want to investigate and they were lazy officers lazy fucking policing you know so that right there give them the dispatch video by chance on that one okay we do shout out to autumn for finding it for us by the way uh let me go ahead and pull it up for y'all real fast um what's the name of it real fast give me the title um jeffrey Dahmer's 13th victim conorak i'm not gonna attempt that that name's yeah, yeah. synth synthesis phone and that's like the dispatch video yeah 13th victim okay and i'm pulling it up for y'all right now let me go ahead and We do a lie, baby. Which one is it? Is it? Um, Here, let me put Conorak. This one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, hi. Um, this, um, I'm on 25th Estate, and this is young man. He is butt naked. He has been beaten up. He is very bruised up. He can't stand. He's study for a lot. He has, he is butt naked. He has no clothes on. He was really hurt. And I, you know, I ain't got no corner on him. I just think him, and he needs some help. Where's the ad? Oh, uh, 25th and State, the corner of 25th and State. I saw him sitting on the sidewalk. Two girls were with him. They called the police. And, uh, this is Dahmer, by the way, guys, speaking about what he, when he walked up on Conorak, what he saw. I had to think of the story quickly. And I told him he was a friend and he was drunk. So he said, I had to come up with a story quickly. I had to tell him he was a friend and he was drunk. And I know this isn't very legible. He was not wanting to go back, so one officer grabbed him by this arm, another officer grabbed him on the other arm, and they walked him up to the apartment. So the police walked him into the apartment. And they left. That's when they did the second kicking. Mm -hmm. Right away? Yeah. How long did it take for the guy? That was the immediately. The intoxicated uh, boyfriend of another boyfriend. <laughs> How was this child? It wasn't a child, it was an adult. Now this is after um that was after they had left him. That was the woman calling back. The intoxicated Asian naked male <laughs> was returned to his sober boyfriend. <laughs> and uh, we're today. Bam. So and that's what they said right after they left the scene. Right? So ended up they ended up getting suspended slash fired for that and they got their jobs back with with uh with uh with back pay guys which is fucking crazy and you guys are probably wondering what is uh 10 8 for police code um it means out of service okay typically it means uh or no in in service sorry in service which means they're basically they they, they finish the call and they're back and ready to deal with another um um another call that might come in through dispatch or oh, we're clear crazy huh All right, so let's go back to the victims. And we got Mike Trollstein in the house, by the way. Uh, he goes, top G meets top Jew, yes or yes. <laughs> Shout out to you, Trollstein. I appreciate you donating to the, to the cause, my friend. Uh, so yeah, this one is probably one of the most heartbreaking ones. So we got here, um, and I think this was the last one. Um, Matt Turner, 20-year-old social butterfly, met Dahmer at a gay pride parade in Chicago, Illinois on June 30th, 1991. Uh, friends of his talked about his love for dressing up and having his photo taken, so Dahmer's typical grooming attempt of offering money for photographs was likely what placed Turner on a Greyhound bus back to Milwaukee with Jeffrey. His family stated that it wasn't out of the ordinary for Turner to take off for various periods of time, being the outgoing and adventurous young man that he was. His warm and inviting personality resulted in him having friends everywhere that he went out 
Uh, once inside apartment 213, Dahmer drugged and strangled Turner to death before dismembering him, dissolving his body in the 57-gallon drum of acid, and yet again keeping the skull as a trophy. So, as you guys can see, we pretty much summarized um, almost all. Did we? Uh, let me make sure I had everybody. Oh, no, hold on. So we, now we, we're not done. Um, we got Jeremy Weinberger. Right, because this is one of the one of the things. Because and here, this might be a little bit of a controversial take, but I want to give my take on this real fast. A lot of people said that Jeffrey Dahmer was a racist and he only attacked minorities, etc. That's simply not the case, guys. He killed white guys. He killed Hispanics. He killed Asians. He went after Asians as well. He uh, killed blacks. He went after everybody. The one thing I will say though is that tip, most of the people that he went after were of lower socioeconomic status, so that he can go ahead and coerce them with. $50, you know, $100 or whatever it may be to take pictures. So he wasn't racist. His thing was he liked men of all different complexions and he went after people that were lower socioeconomic status that were good looking. Okay. That's what he went for. People that he could manipulate. All right. Jeremy Weinberger was an incredibly sweet and lovable 23 year old, a half Puerto Rican man from Chicago who worked as a customer service rep. Uh, okay. Let's see here. So, he was uh, in early July 1991. Jeremy crossed paths with Dahmer at a bar in Chicago, 90 miles away from Milwaukee, called Carol Speak Easy. Of course, Dahmer invited Jeremy to come back to his apartment with him. After asking a friend what they thought of Jeffrey and getting the green light, he decided to go back with Dahmer. Oddly enough, Jeremy ended up spending several days with the murderer. But at a certain point, he understandably started wanting to go home. Jeffrey's abandonment issues came into play, and he convinced Jeremy to have one last drink with him. This one strongly spiked with his trademark prescription sedatives. After Jeremy lost consciousness, Jeremy uh, Dahmer drilled into his skull and injected his brain with boiling water, foregoing the acid technique. Okay, see, so he knew that he wasn't going to be successful with using the acid, so he tried boiling water this time. This didn't work well for Jeffrey after the man woke up seemingly okay, so he forcibly drugged him again and gave him another injection of boiling water to the brain, sending the poor man into a coma for a few days. When Dahmer returned home on the second day of Jeremy's coma, he found that the man had died with his eyes open. He dissolved the body in acid after dismembering him and placed his head in the freezer, then carried on with his day. When a friend of Sweet Jeremy's found out about the murder, the same one who told him, Jeremy seems all right before watching them leave together. He couldn't help but feel responsible. And then uh, and then now we got, I think these are the last two. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so Tracy Edwards was the last one. So we'll go ahead and, yeah, okay. So these are the last two that he actually killed. Oliver Lacey was a 23-year-old man from Illinois. He had recently been moved to Milwaukee to live together with his boyfriend, with his girlfriend, who he planned to propose to and their infant child. He was approached by Jeffrey at the Grand Avenue Mall on July 12, 1991. Yes, and guys, Dahmer spent a lot of time at the Grand Ave Mall uh, in Milwaukee. Can you pull that up, by the way, on the map real fast, Autumn? Mm -hmm. Where he previously lured David Thomas and Conorak, uh, sent, uh, okay, uh, Conorak from. He went back to apartment 213 with Dahmer and was drugged, strangled, sodomized, and dismembered. Dahmer kept the man's head in the refrigerator next to some Arm & Hammer baking soda to try and mask the smell and kept his heart wrapped in plastic in his refrigerator to eat later. I suppose he was too full from eating Oliver's bicep. Okay, next person, Joseph Braidfoot, uh, Braidhoff, was a final victim of Jeffrey Dahmer, who was going through a divorce at the age of 25 and had three children. He was in Milwaukee at the time, looking for work to support him and his kids and to spend time with his brother, Donald. Dahmer sp spotted Jeff Joseph waiting at a bus stop during a rainstorm on July 19th, 1991, holding a six-pack of beer. He offered him $50 to come back with him to his apartment to drink and pose for photographs, and poor uh, Joseph agreed. The father of three was then slipped a drug drink and strangled. Jeffrey continued having sex with the man's corpse for a few days, but his head began housing a maggot infestation, so Jeffrey dismembered him. Dahmer cleaned out uh, Joseph's decapitated head and stored it along with his torso in the freezer, dissolving the rest of his body in acid inside the 57-gallon drum in his bedroom. Fucking sickness, man. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Uh, and then this is the last one here, and luckily, Tracy Edwards escaped, guys. This is the guy that led to... Jeffrey Dahmer getting caught. Dom DeMarco. So Don DeMarco for him. On July 22nd, 1991, Jeffrey, Tracy Edwards met Jeffrey while drinking at a bar in Milwaukee. He offered Tracy money and booze to come back to his apartment and post for photographs, to which he agreed to. He described Dahmer as going from a friendly and pleasant guy to a crazed killer, repeatedly threatening him with a six-inch knife and telling him that he was going to cut out his heart and eat it. 
He witnessed Dahmer enter unpredictable stages of manic behavior, from example, rocking back and forth and chanting while transfixed on movie scenes from The Exorcist 3, which he was known to watch over and over again on a loop. Tracy continuously tried to calm Dahmer, reassuring him that he wasn't going to leave and that he was his friend in a desperate attempt to delay the crazed man from acting on his impulsive urges. Now, instead of us talk, reading about this, guys, let's go ahead and look at his testimony when he was actually uh, from the situ from when he was in Dahmer's home. OK. Now, before I read this, I'm going to go ahead and hit or sorry, before I play this, let me hit some of these chats real fast uh, that I may have missed. And shout out to Autumn, by the way, showing all your chats. Guys, like the video, by the way. There's 20, almost 2,500 of you guys in here. All right, so we got Dillis Trillstein down to Marco for him, 20 bucks. Myron, who wins in a fight? Jeffrey D or Mikey T? That's a good question. I don't know. Myron Goats, fresh and fit forever. Myron gains the goat. Top G meets top Jew, yes or yes. And that's from Mike Trillstein. I'll give you 100 bucks. I, I got to give you a Donna Marco, bro, for all the donations. Thank you. And then we got Shanta goes, five bucks. Can you please put a link to, the, uh, to this page you are reading the victim story on? Yes, I will. I got you, Shanta. Um, Actually, matter of fact, I will put it in the chat for you guys here in a second. Uh, can you please put, uh, and then Myron, tease Jeff Tarot, and that's from Mike, Mike uh, Trillstein. Uh, Jamal Hicks goes, doesn't the Dahmer case prove white privilege? To a degree, yes, and especially in the 90s. Colonel Sanders, 10 bucks, goes, this guy could have been a surgeon, but with a distant father and insane mother, you get extremely disturbed individuals such as this. Disgusting and a shame. Yep, that's true. Mike James, a dollar, thank you so much. Garage Man Teddy goes, what's good, Myron? Curious, do you know if... Netflix had to get approval from the families of the victims. Uh, from the families of victims to do this series. If so, are they paid out? That's a good question, my friend. Uh, the answer is um, they got no money from this. They got no money. Normally, when people try to monetize on Jeffrey Dahmer, the families are able to go ahead and sue and get money. If, To my knowledge, I actually looked this up yesterday. They did not get any money from this Netflix series. Netflix is probably intelligent. They probably did a bunch of legal stuff beforehand to make sure that the families don't get any of the money here. Um, uh, and we got 10 bucks here from Marquise912 former state investigator here serial killers aren't smart or clever they get away for some time simply because they generally kill people they don't know or have a trace or have trace connections with that's a good point I also want to say this too Marquise uh, another reason why Jeffrey Dahmer uh, made it for as long as he did guys is you gotta, guys gotta remember again in the early 90s okay DNA forensics etc it was all still relatively new it was difficult to get them done on top of that, um, homosexuals, right, live double lives, all right? So it wasn't uncommon for someone that was gay to not only live a double life, but to disappear for periods of time, okay? And on top of that, HIV AIDS were killing a lot of gay people. So people weren't sure if they were disappearing because of sickness, because of living a double life, because they had to get out of town. Homosexuality, guys, was not accepted like it is today. It was extremely frowned upon in the early 90s. So what this did was it allowed someone like Jeffrey Dahmer, a predator, to almost operate with damn near impunity because he was kidnapping and uh, kidnapping people, not kidnapping them necessarily, but he was, uh, a, he was well, well, actually he was kidnapping them and holding them hostage once he got them back to his house, right? And these were people of lower socioeconomic status, not strong family ties, desperate, so most of the time gay. So it was almost the perfect concoction, right, of scenarios and variables to allow him to, you know, perpetrate these uh, these acts without being caught. And also, right, and I agree with Marquise on this, he's so far removed from so many of these individuals that it would be very difficult for them to trace it back to him because he's meeting them at like a you know at a nightclub somewhere or you know at a bus stop whatever it may be this is before you know the sophistication of you know closed circuit television cameras being everywhere so hey come back to my place and let's go ahead and have some drinks and i'll pay you to take pictures you're not going to be able to document that so he was able to use that to his advantage and get him back to his place a lot of these murders guys that you guys see these 17 murders he confessed to them and then they were able to go ahead and uh, corroborate it through um information he gave but if he had just kept his mouth shut they probably wouldn't have been able to identify a lot of the people he killed so a big reason why they had they were able to identify that as the victims was based on his information along with helping them identify body parts them then them being able to finally corroborate what he told them to actual dna evidence so uh marquis good point there uh, breakdown of Kane Vasquez attempted murder case. Uh, I can in the future. Frankie Point Dexter goes, I started watching from the beginning, but man, that was the hardest I ever seen you laugh, bro. Netflix and chill. 
<laughs> That's true. Zeus, man's literally has skeletons in his closet. Yes, he did, my friends. Uh, could you do Ross Ubrick and the Silk Road? Yes, I will do the Silk Road for y'all. Don't worry. I actually have documents for that case ready to go. I got that. I got Michael Vick. I got a couple cases on deck ready to go. Um, Big Mo stole my girls. Candace Goat, Myron Goat, Dollar. Thank you so much, Mike James. Uh, CKB, Myron, why do you think, uh, why do you always sniff during fetish streams? Do you have allergies or you've been sniffing the HSI confiscated powder? Uh, no, guys, it's just really cold in the apartment. So I, I you know, it, I have a very sensitive nose. So sometimes I'll get a, a runny nose from it. Also, these microphones are very sensitive. They're very good. So you guys might pick up me sniffing every now and then. But guys, I've never done a drug in my life. Come on, man. If I was on Coke, y'all would know. Trust me. Um, speaking of which, Myron, did Tristan and Rod, uh, uh, send Rod Eric the 1000? I think he did. Christian Garcia, great work. Thank you so much. Uh, and then cool. I think we're caught up on all the super chats. So let's go ahead, guys, and go to Tracy um, Edwards' testimony. And this picks up right when he got into the apartment with Jeffrey Dahmer. We're not going to play the entire testimony. We're just going to play a certain portion of it. So let's get into it, guys. It was about before seven, quarter to seven, something like that. So you're sitting on the couch, he brings you a beer and rum and coke. What happens? Okay, then we just study talking and everything, you know. General talk? General talk. What yeah. happens? Yeah, then I was just, I don't know, getting a little agitated maybe, you know, because of the smell and things. And then we, he threw my conversation off. And guys, remember, he has several bodies in this place. So the place is extremely rancid. Like, it, it smells like fucking shit. And mind you, people had been complaining about uh, about the smell of his place for months. Talking about the fish in the fish tank, you know. Okay, when you start talking about the fish in the fish tank, do you bring that up or does he? Uh, he does. And what do you do when he does that? I turn my turn to the right like the fish tank is here. I'm turning all the way over here. You yeah. turn to your right to look at it? To look at the fish tank, right. And when that happens, what happens to you? Uh, all of a sudden, a handcuff and a knife is pulled on me, yeah. Handcuff is placed on your body? Where? Uh, on my left wrist. And you see a knife? Yeah, the knife, yeah. Now, at that moment, what do you do? First, I feel fear. Then I ask him what's going on. You know, this is not necessary, you know, to pull a knife on me at that Are you moment. afraid? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have any reason to know why he did that? None whatsoever. Did you have any idea at that time it was going to happen? No. Tell me about his demeanor at that time when you looked and realized he had a knife and you and a cuff. What was you were only cuffed on one wrist? One wrist. Yeah. What was happening to the other part of the handcuff? Okay. Yeah. Now pay attention, guys. This is where shit starts to get very weird. Got <laughs> it in his hand. He was holding it. Holding that in the wrist. Yeah. Where was the knife? In the other hand? Uh, the knife was like, yeah, here. The knife was in this hand. He had it on me like this. Let the record reflect he was holding his the knife would, in his right hand, as he showed it, holding the cuff in his left hand. Is that right? right. And your left hand is cuff. Yeah, right. Where do you have the knife? What kind of a knife was it? It was like a military knife, knife a machete of some type. Yep. He had it lower, right up under my rib cage, you know. So he had back it, somewhere in the back here. He had it pointed at your rib cage. Yeah. Did you feel it? Touch yeah, it? yeah he, he had it on me. He had it against my body. What happened? What was going through your mind the moment that happened when you realized you had a knife at your side and a handcuff on your hand? What did you think? I think like, you know, what's going on? You know, this guy is so nice. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like. He was yeah, seriously, he was so nice. The next thing you know. <laughs> Could you imagine, bro? Like, th th think about this for a second. You, you go to some dude's house, right? Uh, assuming you, like, play for the same team. And you're like, yeah, I'm about to get some action. Next thing you know, this nigga puts on the Exorcist 3. <laughs> Just slaps a, a, a handcuff on you. Next thing you know, you're like, what the hell is going on here? Like, what the? What? And then he just starts, like, what like going fuck? like this. Fucking. Uh, you're like, hey, bro, I think I'm going to go. A nigga pulls out a fucking gun next to you. You're like, hey, no, where are you going? And he just grabs a knife and he just fucking puts it on your fucking rib cage. What do you, you want to do? That's fucking craziness, man. And again, Jeffrey Dahmer, right? He's out here with the big aviator, yellow frame glasses. You know, he seems unhar you know, unsuspecting, seems like a nice guy. And man, it's fucking crazy, bro. Looks going to be deceiving. It's pulling knives and handcuffs and all on me, you know. What'd you do? What'd you say to him? I asked him what the problem was, you know, that it's not necessary to do this, you know. What'd he say? 
Uh, he taught me at that point, if I wouldn't do what he said, he would kill me. Yeah. Now, tell us about his demeanor at the time that you look at him and you say, what's going on? You don't have to do this. What happens to Mr. Dahmer? What's he like? It's like not the same person that we met at Grand Avenue Mall. How does he different? His face structure seemed different. You know, his body structure is like it wasn't him anymore. You know, it's like it was a totally different guy there. So he yeah. told you if you didn't do what he told you to do, he'd hurt you. He'd hurt me. What'd you do? What happened? Tell us what happened step yeah. by step as best and, you can and remember. And then all of a sudden he kind of calms down, you know, and then he said he has a key in the bedroom. So we proceed to the bedroom. The key to the handcuffs. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. You know, that's not the cap. You know, I got the keys in the bedroom. Just follow me there, bro. <laughs> like what? Yo! Believed he was going to take him off? Yeah. At that point, I had to go along with this guy, you know, and then if I had to find out, so I walked back there with him. He kind of guides me back there, you know. Guides you back with the cuff and the knife? Yeah, right. And you go into the bedroom? Right. What do you see in the bedroom? Uh, a big, about 50, 60 gallon drum barrel, whatever. Do you ever see a 50, 60 drum barrel in anybody's bedroom no, before? Not at all. Do you have any idea? Did you ask him what it was? No. At that point, I asked no questions at that. Yo, somebody said, T, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Time, yeah. Was there a bed in that room? Yes. How was the bed? Was it made, unmade? What did it, what was, un it was unmade. What, what did you see on the bed, if anything? Something like a stain or whatever yeah, on the bed. What did you think it was? <sighs> at that point in time, I wasn't sure. What did you do and when keep you in got mind, in the guys, bedroom that, as he's holding that we on know, the cuff in? And keep in mind, guys, that we know that he had killed people on that bed. So, and, and it was recently, too. It was like in that month. So that blood that he was seeing was fairly fresh, for lack of a better term. Knife, what did you do? Well, I'm studying this talking, trying to be friends with him. You know? Did you remain standing? Did you sit down? Oh, he made me sit down at that point. We both sit on the bed. Was it at the foot of the bed, side of the bed, head of uh, the bed? Maybe halfway between. Did that room have a TV set in it? Yes. Was there anything going on on the TV? Yeah, the Exorcist movies was playing at that time. There was an Exorcist movie on. Yeah. What? You know which one of them? Uh, the name, the I'm not sure. I think it's three. I'm not sure which one. So there was a movie. Did you know? <laughs> hey, which movie was it that, that was playing when you were about to lose your life, nigga? <laughs> Could you, like bruh what <laughs> oh it to be part of television fuck? or vcr uh vcr normally that's not on regular television so i thought it was vcr you knew there was a movie show right did you see him put it on or was it on no when we first got into the apartment he went through the back to the back bedroom maybe he put it on then i'm not sure okay and then what happened you're both sitting on the bed yes are you still in handcuffs Yes. Is he holding the handcuff? Right. Do you still have the knife? Right. Is it pointed at your side, as you've told us before? Right. You trying to be cool? Very much so. You're not, a, you're not fighting with him? No. Not What's your intention? What are you planning on doing? Getting away. I was contemplating on at the point, jumping out the window. You know, I was basically talking with this person, trying to let him know I was his friend. Yeah. As you were sitting there on the bed, when he had you by the handcuff and a knife at your side, at that time, which would have been maybe seven o'clock? Something like that. What impression was made upon your mind by the conduct, action, manner, expression, and conversation? Hey guys, just so you understand, more than likely this is the prosecutor asking him the questions. Okay. So since the prosecutor is the one asking him the questions, he's asking. And I know it seems really redundant. And for, I know some of you guys are in the chat are putting like, yo, this is L questions, L questions, L questions. The reason why he's going into such meticulous detail is because he wants the jury to see like what to know the details of what was going on. Because remember, the, the jury doesn't know all these details like we do now. Right. There wasn't a Netflix documentary back then that let the people like or, or a Netflix special that let the people kind of see the intimate details. There wasn't a documentary that let the people know what the hell is going on with the case. So. The jury, right, needs to know what's going on, because when you become the jury in a case like this, you are not allowed to know the facts of the case from the press. Like this is another issue that came along with the O.J. Simpson case. And I want you guys to really, really 
understand this, that when you're on a jury for a criminal case, you are not allowed cons to consume any content on the case for which you are a juror. That's very important. And the reason why he's asking these redundant, boring questions that you're like, what the fuck? We know the answer to this is because the jury doesn't know. So what he wants to do is he wants the witness to give testimony that's extremely detailed so that the jury can feel like they were there. And he wants the jury to feel his terror at when he was there next to Jeffrey Dahmer. That's the prosecutor's goal here. He's trying to paint Jeffrey Dahmer in a light that he's a monster. He's evil. He's terrorizing this witness that's on the stand. He wants that. He wants this testimony to make a real impact with the jury. Because remember, the jury are still human beings. They still are going to feel a certain way based on testimony. It's the prosecutor's job to illustrate the criminal activity, right? And make the jury feel like they were there so that they could say, Oh, this nigga's guilty. If I was there, I would have, uh, hell nah, fuck that. That's the prosecutor's job. Now, at this point, mind you, right, he had already confessed. He had already said, yeah, I did it, blah, 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 whatever. But they're trying to go for the maximum, you know, here. Now, keep in mind also that Wisconsin does not have the death penalty. So at this point, you know, it's kind of like, hey, we, we want to, I know we got them, that's a rights, but I want y'all to really feel the pain that this witness was going through when he was sitting there on that bed playing The Exorcist 3, which is a terrible movie, by the way, guys. But anyway, besides being fearful for your life, my man got one of the trashest <laughs> fucking horror movies on. But I digress. Let's continue on. That you observed of Mr. Dahmer. His frame of mind is what you want to know, right? Okay, he acted. At times, he would go through, like, different changes with me, you know? One Tell minute, us about that. One minute he's like nice, then he was telling he didn't want people to leave him or abandon him, things of this nature, you know? Yeah. Well, what did you think about him as a person? What impression was made on your mind of this fellow that you're dealing with here? Yeah, that at times he wasn't himself, and then at times he was, was like a nice guy, you know? He would come and go different times, you know, throughout the whole time. Then he would like sit, being quiet at times, watching a movie, wanting me to watch the movie you know, and just doing a little tanning sounds, you know. Did you observe him watching the movie and how he would react to the movie? Right, he would like to start rocking back and forth when he, you know, certain parts of the movie or whatever. And you have to say, what did he say, madam? He was like chanting at certain times and rocking back and forth, right? Tell us about his chanting. What was that all about? Uh, I'm not even sure. Could you imagine, bro, <laughs> fucking chanting? Like, what would you do, Autumn, in that situation? Um start chanting with him, Trick him. <laughs> <laughs> give us your chant no that's no it. come on you don't got a chant Ooh. that's what you do <laughs> no. you just you would say Ooh. Ah. Ah? <laughs> okay uh, l l uh <laughs> l autumn <laughs> i would do this shit <laughs> Don't kill me. <laughs> I don't think he would want you after that. He probably would. He'd be like, what the hell? And then I would tell him, the show goes on. And then I would tell him, I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He would be excited as fuck. He'd probably get rock solid off that shit. He'd be like, what? You ain't leaving? Nope. The show goes on. <laughs> this is my home. They're gonna need oh, a fucking wrecking man. ball to take me out of here. They're gonna need a wrecking ball, man. Which they eventually did use a wrecking ball in that apartment complex to destroy it. But that's a whole other fucking conversation. I'm having too much fun on this show. Like the fucking video, motherfuckers. All right. Are you not entertained? Let's continue on with the testimony. Sorry, but it was just like I can't tell you the words. I couldn't understand what he was saying at that time. Can you mimic him? How it sounded? It was like a slow slip. Hey, you niggas over here saying Myron, hey, pause. Bro, I'm trying to live. The hell? I know this dude obviously don't want me to leave. I'm not trying to die. Y'all all here saying pause, pause, pause. That's why y'all niggas end up getting killed, getting shanked. I was I would live though. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Turning to Jordan Belford in that bitch. I'm not fucking leaving. Or like, mm, 
some of that nature, some close like that, I'm not sure. Did it keep on for a period of time? Off and on throughout the ordeal. And how about the, the movement <laughs> back and forth? How how was that being effectuated? Uh, just like back and forth, he would do it every now and then. You know? Just as you are rocking in right, your chair. Like this. And chanting. And chanting. Was there any parts of the movie that was going on that you saw that he said anything about? It was like the part about the preacher that used to be a preacher that had got possessed and that uh and that uh it was seemed like he was like interested in that part that part had his attention more than anything yeah. well, tell us about what you mean by that what impressions were made upon your mind when this was going on as to had his attention how would he how did he appear to you I appear like like it was like he wanted to mimic it or be like that part, you know, being demon. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer was on demon time way before we fucking started saying that shit. Guys <laughs> or whatever in that nature. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed yeah, you. Yeah, like he wanted that that type of movie, that part, certain parts of that part interested him. You know, it was like he changed with it at times. Then he would get more aggressive, try to get me to handcuff myself, both hands. And he's told me it made him feel more dominant. Okay, did you and he move off of the bed at any time? Yes, he wanted me to lay flat down, stomach down on the floor at that time. Did you at any time go to the bathroom, use the washroom prior to the time that he asked you to lay down on the floor? No. All right, tell us what happened when, how did that happen that he told you to lay down on the floor? You know, he told me to lay down face down, put both of my hands behind my back because he got, he changed again at that point, like he got more aggressive at that time. Okay, now, but tell us, tell us, uh, did he still have the knife out? Yes, he still had the knife out. And what did you do? Okay, I kind of like laid on my sides for some reason. I guess God told me not to lay flat down or let this person handcuff me, so I didn't. So you were trying to stop that from happening, but you right. got down on the floor. Holy, stop the show, stop the show. Shout out to our fucking guy, by the way, Trusty. <laughs> Find us on the YouTube go, account go, just go, so go. Susan would let me do it. Oh, my God. All right, Trill, that's it. I appreciate the donations, my friend, but save that goddamn money. I love you, though. Thank you so much, man. Fucking baller alert in the fucking house, man. Making us all look bad. Down the Marco, Marco, Marco. Floor. Right. What did he do? He kind of laid across me, put his head across my chest at that point. What was he doing with his head? Pardon me? What did it appear to you he was doing with his head? What was he trying to do? Like he was listening to my heart, because at what? the point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. What? He said he was going to eat your heart? Yes. That's what the right. fuck? Did he still have the knife? Yeah. What would y'all do if, if you, <laughs> what, what would you do, uh, Autumn, if he tell you, hey, uh, he's chanting, playing Exorcism, Exorcist 3, saying he's going to eat your heart? What you, would you do? Um, realistically, I'd probably poop my pants, to be honest. I'd, but that would I'd turn him on. Oh, would it? Probably. Oh, man. Suck it in. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and y'all out here saying you would leave. Get out of here, man. You, you, you better <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street that bitch. I'm not fucking leaving. Yeah. Where was the knife pointed? When I was on the floor, he had it pointed at my groin area at that time. A oh. knife? He had several. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. And then he slipped when I managed to slide one underneath the bed. And I guess during a point of time through an ordeal, he didn't know where the knife was. So I didn't know if he felt that was a threat or not. So he still had a knife. You're on the floor. How long does he lay on top of you trying to hear your heart as you've described it? Maybe a minute, minute and a half. And then what, what did you do then? I knew something was about to happen. So I suggested that I go to the bathroom. I had to use the bathroom. At that time. And what did he do? He kind of guided me to the bathroom. So when you say a guy that you still had hold of your handcuff? Yes. And you went to the bathroom? Right. Did you urinate? Yeah. Were you able to utilize your own zipper or did he touch you at all? Touched me in no way. Didn't attempt to look. He just held me in back. Yeah. So so in other words, he didn't try to look at what your penis looked like or anything? Not at all. So after your... All right. So we can establish that Dahmer is not attracted to urine. Okay. Uh, I guess that <laughs> surprisingly... Did you think that you were going to be the victim of, did he ask to, to, to engage in any homosexual acts with you? None whatsoever. Okay, so now you leave the bathroom and what happens? Okay, then we go back into the bedroom. You know, 
it was like different time spans. We were talking about him leaving his, losing his job. Then he would come to the person that I was first with, you know, and then at certain points he would change. You know, at first he was talking, telling me about how people didn't care for him and things of this nature. And I was trying to comfort him, letting him know that I was a friend, you know, that I wasn't going to try to run away from him or nothing like that. You were being cool. I guess God, you can say that because I had no control. I was just. All right. So he knew what the game was, right? So let's get into the part where he actually escapes. Running out, bringing you out and getting beers and coming no, back. No, I would have been out the window at that point. Sure. If he would have. Did he, when he was fixed, I'm trying to get some words to understand. And he just start going out of himself again. Yeah. Going out of himself? Yeah. He was like paying me no attention at that time. Like yeah. he wasn't there? Was, yeah, he started the chanting again, and it's like just sitting there, you know. And then I just, for some reason, I said, well, I need to go to the bathroom again, and he didn't follow me at that point. Mm, here we go. So I reached up, I got up, and then I got hit him, and I ran out. So Bam. you hit him? Right. Did you have any other belongings there? Yeah, I have my bag right there at the end of the couch. I sit in exactly the same place that I sit when I went in there. So when you got up, he let go of your cuff to let you go to the bathroom again? Uh, he didn't even, he just like, just let me stay there. I was going to go for the window. At that point, he didn't even have the cuff. It's like. I Shout out to Trollstein Gift and Subs, by the way. I appreciate that, my friend. Helping guys go ahead and become members for the Feta channel, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And just so y'all know, I do have like badges that I give out that are like, you know, based on like, like based on federal badges. So shout out to you, man. I wasn't even there anymore. And when you saw that, what'd you do? Mm -hmm. I just seized the opportunity. I said, well, at least I'm going to die trying. I'm not just going to sit here, you know. What'd you do, son? Uh, I hit him I, and I ran towards the door. And he, like, was right there, tried to grab me, get me back in there. And what happened? Then I made it outside. So he wasn't able to like, bring you back bring in? Bring me back in there, no. He tried. He tried. And as you left that apartment, as you got away from him, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you again. Mm -hmm. What impressions were made on your mind by the conduct of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the actions of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the manner, expressions, and conversations of Jeffrey Dahmer that you observed? Can you give us some words? It's like I told the policeman that this freak, this crazy guy, was trying to hurt me. Yeah. Did you run out of the building? Yes, I did. Did you summon help? Yes. Milwaukee Police Department? That's correct. Did they come back there with you to the apartment? Right. Did you eventually go back into the apartment with the Milwaukee police officers? Yes. And then he was arrested. Right. You gave a statement to the Milwaukee police a few hours later? <coughs> yeah. Just to say a few hours, yeah. So there you go, guys. That's his testimony right there, man, which, you know, goes to show the craziness of what he experienced on that night. But this guy was critical to catching Jeffrey Dahmer because what happened was he ran to the police. They got him. They weren't able to un unhandcuff him, which, to be honest with you guys, handcuffs are pretty universal. OK, um, most police officers carry handcuff keys and handcuff keys. Uh, work on almost any set of handcuffs unless he has some strange handcuffs that I've, that like are, aren't necessarily um, standard. Most handcuffs uh, can be opened by by almost any police officer because we have standard handcuff keys. So, <clears throat> actually, you know what? Maybe I can get a set right here, real quick, for you guys. One of my old handcuffs and a key, but uh, to show you guys what I mean by this. But in general, and shout out to Trusty by the way in the fucking house. <laughs> Get the subs. I appreciate it, my friend. He's throwing out the you get a sub, you get a gift, you get a gift membership. So shout out to you, man. Thank you. Um, so so what happens is he goes to the police, he's running down the street, help me, help me, help me. And they go ahead and they find him, right? And they take him back to the apartment. And when they take him back to the apartment, the police say, Hey, where can we get the key? Dahmer, drunk as hell, doesn't know what the hell's going on. Yeah, you could go ahead and look for the key, etc. So one of the police officers goes into his into his room right looking for the key and he ends up seeing like you know the pictures the polaroids of the dead bodies and the dismembered figure fig, uh, figures and also they they the stench so at that point they take Dahmer into custody and they arrest him 
Okay. And that is how he ended up getting caught. Right. So he ends up getting caught. And after this is what happens when he gets caught. When serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer was arrested in July 1991, the Associated Press reported police found 11 skulls scattered in a file cabinet, a closet, a refrigerator, and a freezer, and three headless torsos in a vat in the man's bedroom. Hold up. Wait one second. You say what? 11 skulls scattered in a file cabinet, a closet, a refrigerator and a freezer and three headless torsos and a vat in the man's bedroom. That's the gallon drum that they were talking about, guys. That vat, according to history, was a 57 gallon drum filled with chemicals that were contributing to the slow decomposition of the bodies inside. There were three heads in the refrigerator, alongside evidence that Dahmer had eaten parts of his victims. When police started emptying the apartment, they took out boxes filled with body parts. As neighbors started to realize what was happening, the late night sawing sounds and the smells coming from the apartment became clear. Dahmer's neighbor, Ella Vickers, said, We've been smelling odors for weeks, but we thought it was a dead animal. We had no idea it was humans. When serial killer... Craziness, guys. Craziness, craziness, craziness. So, um... Uh, let me go ahead and remove... Okay, so next, guys, what we're going to go over is, let me just look at my little um, list of stuff here, make sure that I got. So a quick little recap. We're two hours in. Uh, thank you guys so much. You could be anywhere else in the world, but you're here watching to Jeffrey Dahmer Breakdown with your boy Myron, a.k.a. G. Um, so first we went over the intro, who Jeffrey Dahmer was. We talked about his childhood. We talked about his parents. We talked about his first murder in 1978, all the way into 1991, uh, up until he was caught. Um, we went over each murder, how each person was killed. Um, and then we also went over, you know, his failedness in the military, etc. And now uh, Tracy Edwards uh, was able to escape and made it out and he was the stimuli for which the police used to go ahead and catch Jeffrey Dahmer and that's how it led to the medical media spectacle that we have now where he got caught now let's go ahead and take a look real quick at Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment okay so this is the apartment where the police went into and found all this stuff which is wild all right this is what they found so before police the uh police found him oh hold on my bad guys uh at the stream sorry See, I'm sharper with this. I used to be there reading for 20 minutes and not not seeing it. Uh, enlarge. All right. Before police found him, Jeffrey Dahmer appeared to be an ordinary man in his 30s who kept to himself. That image was shattered on July 22nd, 1991, when the victim he lured to his home escaped and sought help from the police. To the shock of the Milwaukee community and local law enforcement, they had unexpectedly, unexpectedly stumbled upon a killer who had kept himself under the radar with a normal job. Inside Dahmer's apartment, the police discovered a box of Polaroids containing depictions of the infamous crimes Dahmer committed in his fridge. And I would show you the pictures, but we definitely go and lose, uh, take an L on YouTube if I do that. Uh, they found a severed human head. Police arrested Dahmer on the spot and began searching his apartment. Forensic scientists and detectives uncovered ghastly evidence like a drum that housed decomposing uh, remains. Dahmer went on to confess to 17 murders. The remains of some of his victims, like his first, were never found. The only evidence of what happened to them are the photos Dahmer took as trophies and his 60-hour confession. 60 hours, guys. Dahmer's story has become fodder for several Hollywood movies and TV shows, and more than a few actors have played Jeffrey Dahmer. The Polaroid pictures and the crime scene photos that came out of apartment 213 and 924 North Street 924 North 25th Street in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, relay a grim scene of events that shook Wisconsin and placed Dahmer on the list of notorious American serial killers. So he had live plants of fish. Milwaukee police took a picture of Dahmer's apartment and from the entrance to show that it had the appearance of a normalcy. Although the apartment was cluttered and dirty, Dahmer displayed live plants, a fish tank, and hung art. In addition to blaming the foul order emanating from his apartment on an unplugged freezer, Dahmer also told his neighbors the fish tank caused the unpleasant smell. So this dude was over here fucking... Stop the cap. Lying all over the place to his neighbors telling him why it smelled. He constantly told them, like, oh, I was cooking meat and I fucked up. And look at this, look, look, look at this uh art that he would pick. This is what he liked, guys. That Adonis type look. This was another corner of Dahmer's living room that appeared ordinary at first glance. The art hung on the walls featuring nude men suggested in a suggestive pose is only hints at the darkness hidden in this picture. 
Dahmer predominantly lured and attacked male victims. Investigators later discovered Polaroids Dahmer, Dahmer took as he subdued and killed his victims. The Polaroids also depict Dahmer engaged, engaging in sex acts with the bodies, although the court later deemed Dahmer a necrophiliac. He was found to be legally sane because he also had intercourse with living men. Crude plans for an altar. Look at this, guys. This was a diagram that he made that he planned to build in the house. Police found hand-drawn plans for the shrine Dahmer planned to build with human remains, including notes for design colors. Get the fuck out of here, these advertisers. Uh, and a wall plaque with fluorescent eyes. He wanted to include a lot of black objects, such as a black and white carpet, a black plush chair, and window covered with black shower curtains and a black table. He even... Uh, scrawled notes of placing painted skulls along the table. Look at this. Black table, painted skulls, incense, lamp with blue globe eyes, wall plaque, painted skeletons, black chair that he would sit in. He wanted to build a shrine. My man out here, seriously, on that demon time. <laughs> Dahmer confessed that he made his victims post for Polaroids on the black table, which he had been planning to use at, to construct an altar. <laughs> Look at him. Either in chloroform in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> man historically either in chloroform have been used to anesthetize, uh, 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 anesthetize patients in addition to chemicals used for preserving remains such as uh, formula dehyde investigators found this chemical combo Dahmer used to subdue his victims openly displayed in the bathroom Dahmer also drugged his guest drinks with sleeping pills sometimes Dahmer would wait until after a consenting sexual exchange before dosing his lovers and you know imagine you walk in someone's apartment you know, you open up the fucking cupboard, then you see this shit. What? Uh, at that point, what the fuck? you got to get the hell out of there. Y'all you, you need to fucking run out of that bitch, jump in the car, and get the hell out of there. Uh, a barrel of acid. Dahmer used a barrel of hydrochloric acid to dissolve his victims and preserve their skeletons. He also whitened the remains with bleach. During the investigation of his apartment, police found three torsos dissolving in the 57-gallon barrel. Dahmer later relayed the occasion uh, when his landlord was looking around the apartment and saw the vat, which Dahmer explained he used to dispose of old fish tank water. Bro, again, once again, fucking stop the cap. My man lied so much. And look at this, guys. This is actually probably one of the strangest things. He had condiments in the fridge. In an interview, Dahmer confessed to eating two people and offered a reason for his actions. At first, it was just curiosity. Then it became compulsive. He said he prepared them with salt and pepper and used condiments for flavor. While Dahmer maintained that he did not commit these crimes before he liked, uh, because he liked torture, he did admit to police that his actions were extreme. I carried it too far, that's for sure. And then here's his bedroom. I told you guys with the blood stains. Most of the young men Dahmer murdered were lured into his bedroom under the pretense of sexual activity based on the bloodstained wall. Investigators determined Dahmer had committed crimes in the room. When investigators pulled the sheets off the bed, they found that it was soaked with blood. <laughs> Police later described Dahmer as emotionless when the perpetrator relayed the details of his crimes. According to a Milwaukee deputy chief, Dahmer talks about king killing people just if it's like pouring a glass of water. A drill, hammer, and saws. In a 60-hour confession, Dahmer revealed that his ultimate plan was to have a lover in a zombie state. To achieve this, he drugged and mutilated his victims while they were still alive. Doctors corroborated his reasoning, stating that Dahmer's intent was to satisfy his sexual need for a not fully cooperative partner. Dahmer later rationalized that he had time restrictions with his six-day work week and wasn't able to search for a totally compliant lover like, he, like the one he desired. And then he had the storage freezer. Pamela Bass, who lived across the hall from Dahmer, described the time she assisted her neighbor in cleaning his apartment to avoid eviction. There has been numerous complaints about the smell coming from 213. Bass maintained that Dahmer attributed the odor to an unplugged freezer, which contained assorted meats his grandmother had given him, which we all know. Stop the cap. In actuality, he stored dismembered body parts in the small stand-up unit. Dahmer, uh, Dahmer planned to save the pieces for his altar and to thaw and cook on occasion. And yep, that's a fucking L right there, my friends. <laughs> so we talked about the house. Um, okay, so let's go ahead, guys, and get into this crazy guy's mind. Um, as you guys know, he was... Oh, and then also, this is the apartment complex, by the way, guys. If I can get it, where the hell is it? Okay, this is it today. 
This is the apartment complex today, guys. It no longer exists. It was knocked down after the the murders. Uh, can you pull up the uh, old apartment complex, what it looked like real quick for me, uh, Autumn? Mm -hmm. And I'll share it on screen for the people. But this is the lot today. Okay, guys? It's gone. All right? This is where it used to stand. It used to be, um, you go up this driveway here, and but the front of, the front of it basically faced right here. And I'm going to pull up what it used to look like before, but it no longer exists, guys. Uh, so what I'm going to do, guys, so I'm going to go ahead and play the Inside Edition interview from February of 1993. Uh, do we have, uh, let me know when you have it, by the way, um, the Oxford Apartments. Oh, okay, I think you, I see that you have it. Um, it is, yeah, go ahead and click that. See the th second row, third picture? There we go. That's it. Enlarge it real fast if you can. That is the that's that's what it used to look like before, guys. Um, scroll up a bit. Maybe you can click and enlarge that picture. That one right there. Yep. That's that's the that's what the apartment looked like before, guys, versus what it looks like now. So before, sorry, before, after. All right. You can see the little driveway up going this way still there today right but they obviously fenced this in so yeah <clears throat> okay so let's go ahead and go to the um the inside edition interview all right from 1993 he picked up i had uh, these obsessive uh, desires so she asked him about what was your intention with the guys that you picked up and also, I want you guys to pay attention to his voice and how he speaks. The actor uh, in the Netflix series did a really good job of imitating him. And, and uh, thoughts wanting to control them. To uh... And also, guys, please do me a favor. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel if this is your first time here. I'm happy to be back. Shout out to Autumn for helping me out behind the scenes. And uh, let's keep going. I don't know how to put it. Uh, possess them permanently. And that's why you killed them. Right. Right. Not because I was angry with them, not because I hated them, but because I wanted to keep them with me. And uh, as my obsession grew, uh, I was saving body parts such as uh, skulls and uh, skeletons. Jeffrey Dahmer is recalling his monstrous past. Almost two years ago in this little apartment. <laughs> Big Mo goes, nothing like a good piece of grilled head, shoulders, knees, and toes with some hot sauce on my cheat day. <laughs> oh, man. Y'all are hilarious, man. This chat is, you guys are fucking, fucking dicks. But it's hilarious, though. And, and guys, we got 1.8K likes, man. Do me a solid, man. Get me to at least 2,500. Because I'll tell you guys this. It took me. Hours of preparation for this pod. All right, man. This is probably going to be one of the most thorough breakdowns on YouTube. Uh, so go ahead and like the goddamn video. In Milwaukee, police discovered the grisly remnants of one of the most horrible crime sprees in American history. Jeffrey Dahmer, an unassuming chocolate factory worker, would eventually confess that he had seduced, murdered, and dismembered 17 young men. He even ate some of his victims' body parts. Oh, shit. He instantly oh, shit. became the center of worldwide media attention, a serial killer unmasked. <laughs> There were protests and press conferences in Milwaukee as people tried to understand how this could have happened in their midst. How did Jeffrey Dahmer get away with murder after murder for 13 years? And we broke that down a little bit, how we how we were able to kind of figure that out. You know, he attacked low, people of lower socioeconomic status. They were gay. You know, a lot of gay people lived double lives, etc. Didn't want to be seen. Uh, you know, HIV and AIDS was was prevalent. People were dying from it. So he almost had like the perfect storm to be able to commit these crimes. And on top of that, he was like recruiting random people that he didn't necessarily know to come back to his place to take pictures. So it would be very difficult for them to track it back to him. How did a boy born into a hardworking middle class family turn into the worst kind of monster imaginable? In this exclusive interview, we put those. My man needs to hit the gym. He stopped working out when he hit the when he went to prison, I guess. 
those questions to Jeffrey Dahmer himself. We met with him at the maximum security prison where he is serving his sentence of 999 years. For the first time, he I, I talks any, about his I'm crimes gonna... and gives us a chilling look inside the mind of a serial killer. It's a process that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, when you uh, depersonalize another person and view them as just an object, uh, an object for pleasure instead of a, a living, breathing human being, uh, it, it seems to make it easier to uh, do things you shouldn't do. The reason why Jeffrey Dahmer was able to get away with his crimes was because of just what you are seeing here. Jeffrey Dahmer is in. <laughs> Say what you will, but Jeffrey had the best, the, the best steaks of the name at BBQ, bro. You guys, <laughs> y'all yeah. got no fucking chill in the chat, man. <laughs> intelligent and articulate that is what makes him so frightening but if you listen carefully to his words throughout this interview you realize it is a thin disguise you do sound though like the kind of person who could have said to himself this is wrong i must stop i always knew that that it was wrong but uh and guys he didn't wear glasses in the trial because he didn't want to have to face his his victims he didn't, if you guys notice, he didn't really wear the glasses in the trial at all. Uh, after the the first the first uh, killing was not planned. I was uh, coming back from the shopping mall back in '78. I had had uh, fantasies about picking up a, a hitchhiker and uh, taking him back to the house. And uh, shout out to my guy, fucking end of sentence. <laughs> Just finished the Netflix series. Yo, guys, go check out his YouTube channel, man. He does crime uh, breakdowns with awesome narration uh, when it comes to, like, hip-hop, current events, etc. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Good friend of the podcast. Good-ass fucking guy. Uh, pause. And, uh, yeah, go check him out, man. Uh, I've actually used... I used this content on my last episode that I talked about, uh, YNW... Uh, not YNW. YSL, excuse me. Um, with the guy that was, you know, providing information and snitching, and a lot of that uh, came from end of sentence. So shout out to 1090 Jake, man. Shout out to 1090 Jake. Having complete control and dominance over him. The hitchhiker's name was Stephen Hicks. He was just 18. Jeffrey Dahmer took him to his parents' house. There he strangled him with a barbell. He dismembered the body and hid it in a drain pipe. It was Jeffrey Dahmer who gave those details to the police in his confession. And that's the old home, by the two, way, two guys that was shown before. No one, no one had a clue as to what was happening for, for over a decade. During that time, Jeffrey Dahmer joined the army and was sent to Germany. He was eventually discharged for a drinking problem and returned to Ohio. My man was getting lit! <laughs> Nine years after Stephen Hicks' murder, the killing began again. What happened to you in the nine years in between that you were able to stop, that you were able to control yourself? It just wasn't an opportunity to uh, fully express what I wanted to, to do. There was just not the, op the physical opportunity to do it then. And uh, I started, when I moved to Milwaukee in 81, uh, I started reading pornography, going to the bookstores. Um, eventually that led to uh, frequenting the gay bars. And then I, one time I brought this uh, young man back to the hotel room, the Ambassador Hotel, uh, was just planning on drugging him. And that was uh, Stephen Tomoy, guys, which we talked about, which was his second um, victim and uh, spending the night with him I had no intention of hurting him when i woke up in the morning he uh, had a broken rib here i was heavily bruised apparently i had uh, beaten him to death with my fists and you have no memory i of have it. no memory of it but that's what started the whole spree all over again Dahmer says he snuck the corpse of his victim, Stephen Toomey, out of his hotel room in a suitcase. Then he took it to his grandmother's house, where he cut up the body and put it in plastic garbage bags. When you killed these men afterwards, were you repulsed 
Were you upset? No, it, at the time, uh, it, was, it was almost addictive. It was almost... Uh, yeah, and for all you young guys out there, like about reading pornography, wondering like what the hell, that's how people got off in the nineties, man. Like you guys gotta remember that like internet and internet pornography was not a thing back in the nineties. Dudes used to have like hustler magazines and Playboys and all this other stuff. That's how you got your porn fix. Or you would get like the VCRs, you'd have to go to like a porn shop. You know, you have a trench coat, you walk in there, nobody know who the hell you are. You just be like, Oh, I don't want nobody to know who I am. You know, you go in there just like, um, yeah, I'm here to get the uh the prawns. Excuse me? What what'd you say? Uh um what? I'm, I'm here to get the prawns. What? You know, so like, you, you got to hide yourself back then, man. Like people will be fucking uh, doing whatever they can to get the porn. But you didn't have the same anonymity and privacy that you have nowadays. OK, but yeah, people will walk in a fucking place like this. You know, say so turning a fucking scorpion in this bitch trying to get some goddamn porn. Get over here! So anyway, carrying on. Uh, a surge of energy. Uh, I wouldn't have to uh, worry about um, any of their needs or anything. I just had complete control of the situation. But Jeffrey Dahmer was out of control. The urge to kill had overpowered him. As police later learned, he wasn't satisfied with his victim's death. He wanted more. Why did you photograph them? It was my way of remembering uh, <laughs> and the sentence is that tonight j goes there's still 90 slash 2000 p magazines in the florida prisons <laughs> yeah i'm fucking dead bro i didn't i didn't know that <laughs> bitches got fucking bangs and shit like that <laughs> oh man uh their appearance their physical beauty uh i also wanted to keep something if i couldn't keep them there with me whole i at least i actually i did watch the conversation tapes with his lawyer wendy um autumn was watching them as well uh yeah man i mean it, he he confessed to a lot of crazy shit in there he really did um but here's the thing netflix left out a lot though i ain't gonna lie to y'all like netflix left a lot because they had to keep it like somewhat palatable and like you know watchable for people but if people really knew like all the crazy shit jeffrey dahmer did like they would just say like, oh, yeah, he would have sexual bodies. But like they didn't like talk about the details like for real or sh obviously show it for obvious reasons. But um, what are your thoughts on that? Because you were watching the, the tape videos. What, what are your thoughts on that, Autumn? Uh, it's super disturbing. But uh, one thing the uh, lady said that was interviewing him is like at times she felt like his mom or his sister. Like um, he was just so like welcoming like in the interview. Mm -hmm. So she felt like close to him. Mm -hmm. Um, so it just shows that he's like a real person, um, or seems like one. And then he has this crazy side. Fair enough. Yeah. And I, and I think some of the best serial killers always have this, uh, this ability to acclimate to society and then like turn on the craziness when they need to, which, you know, Dahmer was obviously able to do. That's why people were so believable or he was so believable. He was able to evade getting caught by the police so many times. Felt that I could keep. Uh, they're skeletons. And yes, he did have groupies when he was in prison, guys. And uh, I even went so far as planning on uh, setting up an altar with uh, the uh, 10 different uh, skulls and skeletons. And what was the purpose of the altar going to be? Uh, as a sort of uh, memorial. Uh, a, a point where I could... I don't know. It's, it's, it's so bizarre and strange, it's hard to describe. A place where I could collect my thoughts. Um, Big Mo in the fucking chat. <laughs> if Jeffrey Dahmer caught me, he would have had enough food for a year. He need gallons of ranch dressing. <laughs> 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 he would have taken you, though, bro. You too fat for that nigga, man. He had a specific body type you wanted, Mo, so too bad. He would have just probably fucked you and let you go. <laughs> pause. And pause. 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 Session when the bodies were still in your apartment there was no time when you would see them and say this is grotesque what have i done there were times there were times but the compulsive obsession with uh doing what i was doing overpowered any feelings of revulsion 
This man with a quiet, almost shy demeanor became a master manipulator who was able to lure strangers he met at gay bars to his apartment. He was even able to con the police into returning a 14-year-old boy to him after neighbors called 911 upset that the child was in the street naked and bleeding. Dahmer convinced the police that he and the boy were simply having a lover's quarrel. It's a intoxicated uh, boyfriend of another boyfriend. <laughs> well, how old was this child? It wasn't a child, it was an adult. After the police left, Jeffrey Dahmer murdered that boy, Conorak Synthesome Phone. This man says he had a near-fatal encounter with Jeffrey Dahmer. He wanted to take some picture of my back. He hit me with a rubber hammer on my neck. He was lucky to escape because by then the killing had become almost routine. Before you went out to pick up a man, was there any kind of ritual you went through? I go to the nightclubs, uh, drink, watch the uh, the strip tea shows, and uh, if I didn't meet anyone at the bars, I'd uh, go to the bath clubs and uh, meet meet someone there, offer them money, and we'd go back to the apartment. Um, have a few drinks, I'd have the, uh, the uh, sleeping pill mixture already prepared. See how he can like speak about this so calmly, guys? You know what I mean? Like, uh, the, the fact that he can like, the fact that he could recall it with such detail and speak about it so calmly and not necessarily care too much, it goes to show you a lot, like what he wanted overrode morals, right? Uh, like, he knows what he did was wrong, but he was like, fuck it. Like, yo, this is what I want to do. And the thing with killing a lot of the times with these serial killers is the more you do it, the easier it becomes. So, and, and you guys, if you guys remember when we we're going through the murders, that's why I wanted to go through all 17 murders. You guys can see how more overt, how much more reckless he becomes, how he just starts. Sometimes if, if he didn't like something, he would just kill the guy off rip versus like, you know, doing his typical methodical uh, drug slash strangulation technique. So, um, and he started to get sloppy. That's why that guy was able to get away. You know, my man out here, like fucking chanting by himself, gets punched in the face, luckily by Tracy, and he's able to escape. Person would drink it, fall asleep, and uh, that's when they would be strangled. <laughs> Watching the movie Exorcist 3 was also part of his ritual. It put this movie trash, but anyway, that's a whole other thing. Him in the mood for murder. I felt so hopelessly uh, evil and perverted that uh, that I, I actually derived a sort of pleasure from watching that tape. Did you like feeling evil? No, no, I didn't, but. Uh, I tried to overcome the thoughts, and it worked for a while, but eventually I gave in. While Jeffrey Dahmer and, may uh, say things today that make it seem like he understands what went on in his mind, he does not. All he can do is tell you what happened, but he cannot stop whatever it is that drove him to kill in the first place. Do you still feel those same urges? Do you still feel that compulsion, that obsession? Uh, now, this is a very interesting answer that he's about to give here. And by the way, guys, I'm looking right now. We got 2,500 of y'all plus, almost 2,600 of y'all guys in here. Do me a quick favor. Like the goddamn video. We should have 2,500 likes. I hate asking for likes. Y'all don't got to donate a dollar to the show. You don't have to do anything. All I ask is that you, number one, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Don't be a fucking ninja watcher. Don't be one of these weirdos that sits there with a the fucking hood on thinking, yo, I'm just going to like watch the content and not ever like like anything. Just like the video, man. It ain't that hard. All right. I wish I could say that uh, it just left completely, but uh, no, there are times when I still do still do have uh, the old compulsions. Jeffrey Dahmer says as time went on, his mind became more and more warped, and yet he was clever enough to continue to elude police and lure young men to his apartment. And that was a part of the reason why they, they got him, uh, made, they made him sane, because they showed that he took steps to essentially evade detection, which means you're not that crazy. I should warn you, the details are very graphic. All right, it's about to get crazy in here, guys. So viewer discretion is advised from this point forward. So be ready. Yo!
Like the video. Let me hit some of these chats real quick. Uh, Garage Man Teddy 10 bucks goes, did they allow this freak visitation? If so, you think they were on uh, a watch list or some kind of contact by law enforcement or feds? Uh, yes, they did allow him visitation. His father visited him once a month. He made that 11-hour drive to go see him. Uh, so, yeah, no, he definitely did uh, get visitation. And he got a lot of fan mail, guys. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer made around $10,000 in the, uh, you know, year and a half or two years he was in prison uh from fans uh l leon goes uh jeffrey Dahmer like meat fitter fit, literally and figuratively you guys are hilarious and then we got let's see here what else what else what else uh we got uh if jeffrey Dahmer caught me okay we got that one shout out to you big mo fucking being a clown in here i started having these obsessive thoughts uh, when i was about uh, 15 and 16 and they got worse and worse what were your fantasies about uh, they were sexual fantasies of control, power, uh, complete dominance. Uh, they became reality. And the reason why, guys, if you really think about it, why he had such an infatuation with being dominant and being in control is that he didn't really have control of his life. The man was an alcoholic. He failed at everything he did. He couldn't stay in the military. He couldn't stay in college. He couldn't keep a job. He... Uh, couldn't get people to stay with him long term. He couldn't attract a girl, could barely attract a guy. So uh, his mom left him. His father left him. He was in a home for several months on end, his senior year of high school. He couldn't uh, land friends. So he didn't have control of his own life, right? So since he didn't have control of his own life, he had to control other people's lives and take it away. That's how he felt control finally again, all right? So... Um, a lot of the times, alcoholics drink alcohol to escape reality because they're not in control of reality. Okay? So that's a, a very important note that you guys need to need to make when it comes to Jeffrey Dahmer and why he was so obsessed with control. And DHV, uh, Dan H. goes, the last victim who escaped actually killed someone himself later on in life. Crazy, man. Read on him. All right. Thank you. I didn't know that, bro. Pleasure in that fantasy. There was excitement, uh, fear, pleasure all mixed together. Jeffrey Dahmer fulfilled his fantasies by murdering and dismembering 17 young men in time. Rest in peace to all these guys. Horrible. His desires became more extreme, his deeds more grotesque. Listen to him talk about the most unnatural things in the most matter of fact of ways. That's when you realize that none of it has touched him. I was uh, branching out. That's when the cannibalism started, eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle. It was a way of uh, making me feel that uh, they were a part of me. It, it, for, at first, it was just curiosity, and then it became compulsive. Then I tried to uh, keep the person alive by inducing a zombie-like state. Um, by uh, injecting uh, first a uh, dilute acid solution into their brain or uh, hot water, and uh, it never did completely work. Could someone like you be stopped? Could you be helped? No, I, I was I was dead set on, on going with this compulsion. It was the only thing that gave me any uh, any satisfaction. He became so warped by his evil impulses that he even took a victim. And if you look at him, man, like there were a lot of women that found this guy attractive. You know what I mean? A lot of people in the gay community found him attractive as well. Pause. Like he didn't have to do this, you know, but his extreme need to be in controlling, wanting a sex slave and wanting people near him all the time. And, you know, the extreme abandonment issues surfaced in the most in the worst of ways. Victims head with him to work at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory. I kept the uh, the mummified uh, head and skull of one of the victims in uh, a, a carrying case in my locker at work. Were you almost flaunting it? Yes, but that's how strong the compulsion was. That's how bizarre the, the desire was. I wanted to keep something of, of the person with me.
Jeffrey Dahmer exhibited some disturbing behavior early on. He began drinking heavily as a teenager, dropped out of college, was arrested for indecent exposure, disorderly conduct, and fondling a 13-year-old boy. Tragic. Holy man, what the fuck? <laughs> one of his murder victims would be that boy's brother. Do you know what started it? Was there any kind of incident that you can remember? To this day, I don't know what started it. And uh, the person to blame is sitting right across from you. That's the only person. Not uh, parents, not society, not pornography. I mean, those are just excuses. His macabre 13-year crime spree finally ended when this man, Tracy Edwards, brought the police to the infamous apartment. Like the others, he had gone there with the promise of money. He was listening to my heart because at a point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. I hit him I, and I what? ran. What was the turning point for you that made you suddenly realize that you had done something terribly wrong, something you should be sorry for? It was uh, the night of the arrest. I have no memory of what happened uh, during the six hours before uh, the last victim ran out of the apartment. I heard yeah, he was drunk as hell, which is what led to him like giving, you know, consent or whatever. He didn't really know what the hell was going on, which, you know, you can argue in court like, hey, my client wasn't of sound mind and he gave the police consent. But I mean, at that point, <clears throat> like it was probably they would have probably been able to get a warrant to get in there regardless. But, you know, that's a whole other argument. A knock on the door. And the police were there uh, with, with the last victim. Uh, they asked me where the key was to the handcuffs. And I was, my mind was in a haze. I s sort of pointed to the bedroom, and that's where they uh, found the pictures. And they Stupid. yelled, cuff them. I Stupid. was uh, handcuffed. And uh, it, it was just the realization that there was no point in trying to hide hide uh, my actions anymore the, the best route was to help help the police identify all the victims and just uh, make a complete confession when it was revealed that most of the victims were black or homosexual people in milwaukee were incensed many felt that was why he went after them and why the police didn't seem to care when their families reported them missing 10 of your 17 victims were black. Were they racially motivated? It, it was not racially motivated. It was not a sexual preference. It was just to find an obsession with uh, the best looking young man I could find. While you just heard him say that his sexual preference had nothing to do with the killings, no, he has not come no, to terms I'm with his really homosexuality. Always. Never understood it. There was no use trying to fight it because I, I couldn't rid myself of it. It was... His father also, he had a tough time coming out to his dad. His dad never accepted it, guys. So that's another reason, too, why he was so big on, like, containing it and not necessarily letting it out. So that also was uh, a play in this as well, the repressed sexuality. It was too powerful and persistent. Do you dislike it? Yes, it's caused uh, a lot of problems for me. A lot of conflicts and uh, unanswered questions. Yo, someone in the chat got me dead. <laughs> Someone said uh, he takes more accountability than the girls that come on the show. <laughs> the conflicts remain with him, and so do his compulsions. But in prison, he finally cannot act on his savage desires. If you were out on the street now, would you still be committing the crimes? Probably. If this hadn't happened, there's no doubt I probably would be. I can't think of anything that would have stopped me. All right, yeah, man, yeah, fucking. I ain't gonna lie, the chat today was on some crazy. Uh, it was on some fucking diva time. You guys are fucking hilarious, man. Holy, <laughs> he said he took more accountability than across the show. Oh man, all right. So, um, so obviously, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get into what ended Jeffrey Dahmer, guys. Um. So where are we at here? Um, so what happened lastly was Jeffrey Dahmer was killed, guys, in prison, okay? He was killed by this dude right here, if I can find him. You know what? Here he is, Christopher Scarver. All right. Um, share screen with y'all real fast. 
So um, he was killed by this guy. Christopher J. Scarver, senior, born July 6, 1969, an American criminal known for the fatal assault on Jeffrey Dahmer, serial killer, and Jesse Anderson, a murderer at the Columbia Correctional Institu Institution in 1994. Scarver used a 20-inch uh, metal bar, which he had removed from a piece of exercise equipment in the prison weight room to beat and fatally wound Dahmer and Anderson. Scarver was sentenced to two further life sentences for the killings. And ironically enough, he killed Dahmer the same way Dahmer killed his first victim, Stephen Hicks, with a dumbbell, a weight, a weight training, uh, a piece of weight training equipment, which is crazy how the world comes full circle. And just so y'all know, this guy suffered from mental illness as well. He claimed that, you know, God had told him to do it. Uh, so that's why he had done it. And I got a video on this as well. Here is the guy that killed Jeffrey Dahmer. Or was awaiting trial in a Wisconsin jail, accused of killing 27-year-old job trainer Stephen Lohman. It was then that the arrest of a 31-year-old Milwaukee man was announced. He had the remains of 11 men and boys in his apartment. That man later confessed to killing a total of 17 men and boys in Ohio and Wisconsin. He also confessed that he would sometimes mutilate and cannibalize his victims. Scarver came to know serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, much like the rest of America, via the news. But Scarver got to see more of Dahmer than most people. Both men were convicted murderers, serving out life sentences together in the Columbia Correctional Institution outside of Madison. Although Scarver was also a convicted murderer, he couldn't stomach the things he'd heard Dahmer had done. Scarver later told the New York Post that Dahmer would antagonize inmates by making food look like severed body parts and leave them for people to find. Scarver said he kept his distance from Dahmer until 1994. Scarver claims when the two were left alone in the prison gym, he bludgeoned Dahmer to death with a metal rod. He also killed another inmate at the same time named Jesse Anderson. According to what Scarver told the New York Post, Anderson and Dahmer antagonized him, so he killed them. Scarver initially pleaded not guilty of the prison murders, claiming insanity. At his first court appearance, Scarver entered the courtroom singing. Rain or shine, sharing your dreams, your heart and your mind. But he, what the fuck? What? <laughs> he was, he was excited. Fuck? He was happy. Later changed his plea to no contest. He did so in exchange for being moved to a federal prison instead of serving out his life sentences in a state penitentiary. He was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences on top of the first one. The insanity plea wasn't out of the blue. When Scarver was awaiting trial for killing Lohman in 1992, he told the psychiatrist that voices had urged him to commit that murder. Specifically, he said it was the voices of a family, a mom and a dad, a boy and a little girl. Scarver shot Lohman in the head four times, then made a manager write him a check for $3,000. He also stole the manager's credit card. Scarver went to his girlfriend's home, where hours later, police found him sitting on the stoop of her apartment. He had the check, the credit card, and the gun he used in the murder in his pocket. Scarver told the psychologist he'd never been in trouble with the law or even been in a fight. He said the voices of the family told him everything was going to be all right and it was meant to happen like this. The New York Times reported that he said the voices also told him, quote, I'm the chosen one. Scarver has been in jail or prison since he was about 20 years old. According to his webpage, he was placed in solitary confinement for 18 years after killing Jeffrey Dahmer and Jesse Anderson, but he, quote, earned his way out and into a medium security prison. When he was initially arrested for murder in 1990, his girlfriend was pregnant and gave birth after Scarver was sentenced. The child was named Chris after his father, and the two maintained a relationship through letters, according to what his son told CNN in 2014. During his time behind bars, Carver became a poet and wrote a book titled The Child Left Behind, Poetry of Christopher J. Scarver. Scarver also writes short stories, musical compositions, and songs, and creates art. He's proactive in writing prison policy proposals and initiated the American Prisoner Repatriation Act. Scarver also tries to encourage his son. In part of a letter the younger Chris shared with CNN, Scarver wrote, Tough times don't last. Tough people do. And you are the toughest kid I know. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, see where he's at, guys. I don't know if he's actually... They're saying he's in the federal system. I'll go ahead and share a screen with y'all real quick so you guys can see what I'm looking at here. Because I, I looked in the... Someone said... Uh, when I researched it, they said that he might have been in the uh, in the Colorado system, but I don't know about that. So uh, let's see here. Offender information. Let's see here. Let's see, I hate the state records because it's always a pain in the ass to find someone. Um... Is this it, maybe? Oh, my God. This is so trash. Okay. You know what? They said federal, so let's do this first. BOP.gov, right? Inmates. Find an inmate. Let's see if he's actually in federal custody. Christopher. 
and then Scarver. Black. Oh, oh fuck, I'm retarded. Male, bam, let's see. Hmm, is this him? Wait, not in BOP custody. Interesting. So, hmm, this is very strange. If this is actually him, let's see if this is actually him. I'm going to move this out the way. Let's see if the birthdays match. So, he was born July 6, 1969. Uh, 69, would that be make him 53 years old? Someone, someone with the math, help me out here. Autumn, you got to think fast. Uh, yes, it would. It would? Yes. Okay. And is his middle name Jay? Christopher J. Scar, yeah, senior. So yeah, this is probably him, but why? This is strange why it says not in BOP custody. And what would the federal charge be that they would charge him with? So I would have to uh, research this a little bit to let y'all know. Because, um, let's see here. Do they have it? He's going to release a tell-all book. I don't think it came out, though. Uh, later, federal district court judge Barbara ordered Scarver and about three dozen other seriously mental elements to be located from the Wisconsin facility. Scarver was uh, in Colorado. So he's there now, Centennial Correctional Facility in Colorado. Okay. So, so it says here, okay. In 2004, Scarver brought a federal civil rights lawsuit a uh, suit against officials of the Wisconsin Secure Program Facility in which he argued that he had been subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. Contrary to his constitutional rights, Scarver stated that he spent 16 years in solitary confinement as a result of the Dahmer killing. A district judge dismissed the suit against several of the defendants and ruled that the actions of the remaining officials could not be considered unlawful. Scarver unsuccess unsuccessfully appealed the decision in 2006. Later, federal district court judge Barbara Crabb ordered that Scarver and about three dozen other seriously mentally ill inmates be relocated from the Wisconsin facility. Scarver was eventually relocated to the Centennial Correctional Facility in Colorado. Okay, so let's click that real quick. It is a prison located in the East Cannon Complex in Fremont County, just east of Cannon City, Colorado. CCF consists of two separate buildings, north and south. The South facility opened in 2011. Uh, level 5 maximum security facility. All offenders at CCF are non are in administrative segregation, also known as solitary confinement. CCF is the uh, counterpart of the Colorado State Penitentiary, also known as East Cannon Complex. The North facility is, originally, is the original facility and primary houses level 5 maximum security offenders. So I guess maybe they moved them here so that he can get mental treatment, mental um, uh, mental health treatment. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, but yeah, I can't think of like a federal offense that they would get him for for com killing someone in a state prison. Uh, I don't know how what federal laws that would trigger. But anyway, uh, so let's go ahead and go back to y'all. Okay, so uh, did I miss any chats here? Oh, let me hear. Let me pull up, read the chats. And then we'll close this bad boy out. So, and thank you guys so much for the donations. Uh, the likes right now, guys, are at uh, two point two. If you guys could get me to twenty four hundred, I would really appreciate that. We're at two point two. Just get me another two hundred. That will give us as uh, a lot of. Um, it would give us the engagement that we need to push the channel back into the algo. Okay, Big Mo goes. I guess you can say he dabbles in the dark. If he had the BLK app, he'd be making a killing. This <laughs> nigga Mo, shout out to you. The last victim who escaped actually killed someone himself later on. Crazy life, man. Okay, read that one. Quavo dollars. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think I got all the chats here. So yeah, guys. So that is the breakdown right there. I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast, man. Shout out to Autumn. Autumn, where can the people find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Fallen for Autumn. Bam. Fallen. Can you spell it out real quick? Yeah. F-A-L-L-I-N-N-F-O-R-A-U-T-U-M-N-N. -N -N. God damn. What the? <laughs> okay. That's, uh, <laughs> I'll put her Instagram below for you, for you fucking perverts that want to check her out, uh, and send dick pics. But, uh, <laughs> but other than that, guys, um, I love you guys. Thank you so much for the support. We're going to be back tomorrow for uh fresh and fit money Monday. Uh, we'll have a topic for you guys when it comes to creating wealth. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the episode, man. Uh, don't forget to like the video on your way out. Share this video with a friend. I'm happy to be back and peace. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Fed it covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass.
murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket, you don't know, and he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of premeditated murder. Racketeering and RICO conspiracy. Young, young slime life, here and after referred to as YSL, the defendants. Uh, 6 9 and then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, 6 9 ran well, I'm a fed, I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh, wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes. AKA, Pooch IC violated. You're ordered to stay away from the victim. Pooch IC arrested after, arrest after shooting at King of Diamonds, oh, Miami Strip Club, injured this one is person. The, this is the one that, that's going to fuck him up because this gun is not traceable. Well, what happened at the gun range? Here's your boy, 42 Doug, right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. They, they can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm going to lock my trip away. Right, right. And well, the first bomb went off right here. Suspect two sent down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al Qaeda. Two terrorists, the brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lynn Sarnev. When the cartel ship drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay, trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're gonna go over his path.